Okay, uh, good morning everyone. It's two minutes past the 9 a.m. U.S. Mountain Time. Uh, this is day two of the UFS Middle Range Weather App Training uh, by DTC. And uh, today we are going, we have three sections and uh, we will listen a lot of great uh, talk from uh, many subject uh, matter expertise from uh, EMC, DTC, and the GFDL. Uh, before we start, I just want to mention we have plenty of time for question and answer. If uh, during the speaking, during the presentation, uh, please use Slack to uh, just uh, write your questions. You, you, you can either just write, I have a question there. Uh, after the presentation, we will start from Slack channel, uh, channel presentation channel to ask questions. Or you can wait until after uh, uh, the presentation and uh, turn, uh, unmute, unmute your uh, Zoom and ask there. Okay, uh, let's start. The first uh, talk today is an uh, uh, introdu introduction to NSAP Lives as you see from screen uh, by Kyle Gehizer. He is from EMC. Uh, Kyle, please start when you're ready. Sure. Okay, so uh, today I'm going to talk about NSEP Libs, which is our um, requirement to build the model. Um, it's a collection of around 15 developed, uh, internally developed libraries that are used by the weather model and other applications. Um, they do things such as provide model IO and grid transformations, interpolation, and grib um, input and output. Um, mostly Fortran, a little bit of C. Uh, we just transitioned to a CMake build system as part of the public release earlier this year. And we're on GitHub, uh, so we use Git. Um, okay, and uh, just as a fair warning, um, most people can treat NCEP libs as a black box, uh, as in you once you build them and you show the model where they are when you build the model, you don't need to worry about them. So uh, I'm going to throw a lot of libraries at you, and it's not important to know what they do. Uh, I'm just trying to give a general idea of what the libraries do as a whole, um, because most people, as I said before, will just never have to delve into NSEP libs themselves if you're just trying to run the model. OK, so with that out of the way, um, so we have this library hi hierarchy. And NSEP libs kind of fits in the middle of it all. We have our external libraries such as HDF5 and NetCDF and ESMF, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and these are the, the prerequisites to build the model and NSEP libs. So once you build your external libraries, then you can build NSEP libs. And then from there, um, NSEP libs is used by the weather model. Uh, it's used by UFS utils and other applications. Oops. Um, so. I'll just talk a little bit about NSEP libs external. This is the first step in building and running the weather model. Uh, it's a compilation of third party libraries that we need, as I said before, and that the UFS weather model needs and you know all of our applications. Um, and you can configure this to build only certain libraries if you already have, let's say, uh, you know your own lib PNG on your machine. And we also provide uh, Lua and uh, TCL modules. Uh, so if you are on a computer with um, you know, HPC module support, you can just use those. Um, so this is a list of all the libraries. Um, it's like it's not really important to know the names or what any of these do really, but you can just kind of see they all kind of mostly deal with either IO or GRIB or and there's a couple other ones that do you know other things such as interpolation and spectral transformations um, so uh, i kind of split them up into uh into the groupings so these are our io libraries so the model needs a bunch of different needs to be able to read a bunch of different input files of various types such as binary and sigma restart files and uh you know certain sub components have their own input output. Um, so these are the libraries that handle the input and output for certain data types in the model. Um, we have some GRIB libraries. 
Grib is a common file format used in meteorology to store weather data. And there's uh, Grib1 and Grib2. Uh, Grib1, Grib2 builds upon Grib1. Um, so we have this G2 library and code and decode Grib2. Um, more G2 for grip, grid templates. Um, Wgrib2 is our main, um, you know, it's an executable and you can do lots of stuff with it. If you want to work with grid files, uh, grid two files, uh, open and you know, view the contents and manipulate them. And then we have these two little libraries, W3EMC and W3NCO, which are for grid one that um, we're in the process of combining them. Um, then you have some of these other libraries. Um, so we have our SP library, which is for spectral transformations for the global spectral model, which we don't currently uh, use anymore. But if you want to read the input um, you know, from you know, from the past, you might still need that. Uh, land surface utilities, this reads in um, and creates land surface uh, input. Um, and we have these IP and IP2, which they interpolate between different grids using different grid, grib, grid descriptors. And you can go from you know, spectral to Gaussian, or just you can go back and forth through many different types of uh, grids and interpolation methods, bilinear. Uh, bicubic and et cetera, et cetera. There's many of those. Uh, and this is just to show kind of the layout of the libraries. This isn't important to know, and I know it's kind of confusing, but um, we have, you know, all these libraries are interdependent in some way, or at least most of them are. Um, you can just see kind of how they're related to each other here. Um, uh, one of the nice features we have about NCEP Libs is our CMake build system, which we just introduced as part of the public release. Um, it's an open, CMake is an open source cross-platform family of tools designed to test, build test and package software. And it's similar to auto tools as in you don't write the make file yourself, you write um, the CMake file, which generates make files for you. And this makes it easier to have an out of source bit uh, build. It lets you integrate tests in the build system easily. You get uh, package configs, which help you makes it easy to locate and use packages with you in your own project. If you wanted to use, let's say, one of our libraries, for example, you just do find package, you know, uh, SP, and it'll, you know, you just you it'll let you use that in your uh, CMake build. And it's a lot easier than manually writing make files. And uh, for this, uh, for release, we had, we updated um, our build system for this uh, second public release, which uh, we're just working on coming out with. It has many uh, fixes and improvements to our CMake build. Um, then there's the concept of this NCEP libs umbrella build. So you saw that list of you know, 15 plus libraries and all building all those individually would be pretty tedious. And you don't really need to worry about individual libraries when you're trying to build the model. You just want everything that you need and that's that. So we have this umbrella build that packages all the libraries for you uh, and it's just called NCEP libs. We have it on GitHub. Um, it requires a uh, Fortran and C and then you build NCEP libs external first or provide those third party libraries yourself. And then you can build NCEP libs and from there you can build the model. And also for this, we provide a couple of uh, options, um, provide some Lua and TCL modules uh, once again, and you can have an option to do a flat or hierarchical install structure. If you wanted to, let's say, install multiple versions of uh, the same library in a single install tree without overwriting them. Um, so like I said before, it's available on GitHub. It's really easy to build. I just sort of list the options here. Um, module, and then you can use your modules and then module load NCEP libs and you get all those libraries in your path. And you can 
build the model from there. Um, so some of the things we're currently working on here, uh, we're doing like a, ma a major refactoring to add more testing and uh, refactoring. And we're going to combine some of these duplicate libraries, IP and IP2, W3 EMC and W3 NCO. We're adding some Doxygen documentation and along with some improved testing and CI. Um, and you can, all this, all of our information here is available on GitHub. Uh, NSEP libs external, NSEP libs. We have a little wiki for NSEP libs. Uh, if you encounter any issues, uh, we're very active on GitHub. So if you post an issue there, uh, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Um, and that's actually all I have. Um, any questions? Okay, thank you, Kyle. And uh, uh, we do have a questions from Slack. And uh, Christina, okay. and do you want to unmute yourself and ask uh, questions? I can. Yeah, sure. Um, so I just would like a clarification how CMake is connected to Seam. Or you know, can you maybe talk about that? Is CMake only usable or used for libraries, these external libraries, or is CMake an alternative to Seam? No, CMake is uh, an alternative to Auto Tools or make, instead of and, and make files. It's part of the build system. Uh, I'm not an expert at Seam, so if anyone wants to chime in about how Seam and CMake relate, but. Uh, CMake is its own independent third-party tool that is used across a wide variety of software projects to build. Okay, I see actually Yufuk uh, is here. Do you want to make comments? Uh, can, you, can, you, uh, can you repeat again your question? Okay. Sorry. Um, my question? Yeah, Christina, your, okay. your question. Uh, yeah, I, I'm still unclear about the connection between CMake and Seam, if there is one. So is, for example, Seam, then there is this function case built, is that using CMake under the hood, under the, you know, under the rook, hood? Uh, or is CMake just another alternative to Seam? So I think that's what I wanted to understand better. Yeah, the, the problem is that the different UFS application use different build system. For example, Huffs still use make-based build system, but UFS mid-range Vader use CMake. And for example, S2S, I think using CMake also. So because of that, we have a unified interface for the UFS ATM interface in, in the same side that supports both make and CMake build. So because of that, it could be a little bit complicated because we need to support different UFS application in the same time while we are trying to create a unified version of interface. At this point, it's a little bit difficult for us because as I told before, there are different UFS application and then they are not very synchronized in terms of the build system and the code base. But I think in the, in the near future, they, they will converge in a certain point and then we could have more um, clean and simple uh, uh, SIM interface for the, for the, mo for the model, uh, both for the standalone and coupled application, I think. So is SIM actually not used at, uh, internally at NOAA? No, so SIM use its own a build system. It's not triggering the internal build system, but it just triggering the CCPP because CCPP suite, the CCPP build requires additional uh, uh, additional uh, Python script that needs to be triggered to create a, 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 the, the Fortran files on the fly just by looking those XML files. So. Because of that, the, the CCPP and the model interaction and CCPP and the SIM interaction is not very clear at this point. But eventually, we will use the model internal CMake 
uh, the build system. And if, if it's possible, we will also plan to use the module files ship, ship with the model itself. So by this way, we could have full control and then we can use, we don't need to, we don't need to modify the XML file in the same site uh, specific to, to certain plat platform by this way, because we will get all those information from the model itself. But it's evolving thing. So once all the models converge in the UFS site, that will be much more easy for us to maintain differences between those different applications. Are you abandoning Seam in future versions? Was it or I, I still don't quite. I, I think I can address a, a, what may be some of the confusion. So they, they do sound similar, CMake and Seam, but they are completely unrelated. Um, CMake is a software tool that's used kind of outside of atmospheric science, whereas Seam is mm -hmm. a specific framework uh, in Earth system modeling. Seam is um, just, a, yeah, Seam just a workflow, this case control system, but underneath it, it uses CMake and Make, it supports both of them to build the model. Okay, uh, so if I have the case build statement in Seam, I will use CMake under the, without my knowledge, I use for UFS For UFS application, yes, we are using CMake, but for example, the HAFS application, the regional hurricane application, we are using Make. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks for the question and the discussion uh, from our subject matter expertise. Okay, uh, we do have another question from uh, Guo Qing. And uh, Guo Qing, can you unmute and ask your question? Uh, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, the, I'm wondering because I'm trying to build a GSI with NSAP libs, but I don't know. For GSI, we need the Wolf IO library. So is that, I, I see that is already included, but I cannot find from some tags or some branch. So I'm wondering which branch or tag of NSAP libs I should use. To build GSI? Yes. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I know people that have been doing work on building, integrating GSI with our, the, with our build system, uh, Mark Potts. And um, I don't know exactly what, what you need to build GSI. I've never built that myself. Okay, so so for general, what what uh, branch or tag of NSAP libs I should use if I uh, want to use the Wolf IO library? I would take the NSAP libs umbrella build if you just to get them all. And I would take, we have a tag V1.2.0 or just take the latest tag the latest from develop should be fine if you just get clone that should be fine yeah i just checked the tag uh, like uh ufs volume 1.1 that does not include wolf io yeah so that that's a relatively uh new addition for us um it's it's included in the in the updated uh build you can get wolf io okay i may check that further okay thank you Okay, uh, I think we have another comments, or I don't think it's questions from Sean, right? If you can, uh, uh, anybody, if you want to comments, make comments to uh, questions, you are uh, welcome to unmute and speak up. I just, this is Sharon. I just had um, yeah. experience in the past trying to build older GSI executables, and it was hooked into the wharf to get to um, the post and set post to work. And I'm wondering if you're compiling an older version of GSI and it's still got that hook. And now in the future, we don't depend on the wharf uh, routines as much, but maybe it's changing back. So I, you know, I could have old information myself, but um, I've had to do this before I've kind of found somebody's built wharf on my machine and I point to those libraries and I'll make a stub routine just to try to avoid being dependent on it. So I think in the future, you it should be cleaned up and you it's more um, straightforward what you need routine, uh, libraries for instead of this wharf dependency. So hopefully that goes away, I think would be good. Yeah, I think I uh, totally agree with you and uh, uh, GSI and uh, UPP actually only need the wharf IO interface and uh, 
So we really don't need the whole wolf system to build GSI. And I think GSI and uh, UPP both actually go want to same path, try to isolate a small wolf IO library. And this wolf library, at least from my understanding, is for the UPP. And we are not sure if it uh, works for GSI, but I'm I'm guess it's very close to what GSI needs. And uh, also, I uh, let's see. Actually, do we have any more questions, comments from every uh, everyone? <laughs> Please feel unmute and ask. I guess this is Sharon again. Um, I have a question in the future, is the intent to continue with loading modules to use the CMake um, utility or are we gonna switch to that CMake config file? Where, was, you know what I'm uh, talking about? Yeah, so they, they actually work together. Um, so if you load the module, it'll set um, a variable like, um, you know, warfi under, underscore root which then allows CMake to know where to find that package config file at. So you can use them independently. So you can use the package config file without a module. The module just sets the environment variable so you can, so it knows where to look, but that's completely optional to use modules. So that, so modules aren't gonna go away. I just, it wondered if, if it was gonna go more to these config files, which was more obvious no. what's going on. Um, because sometimes when I'm trying to, uh, fix it. I'm I'm trying to understand what environment variable my software needs, and I can't tell. But mm -hmm. if I build my s libraries with CMake, it makes those CMake config files, right? Yes. And then I can just point to it, and it's very obvious what's going on. It just seems more yes. direct. Yes. Yes. Uh, the the modules are completely optional and provided just for convenience, so you don't have to know which variables to set yourself. And Kyle, correct me if I'm wrong, but in addition to the module files, the the version one tag also builds uh, some scripts that will set all those environment variables as well. Yes, 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 it does. Okay, so that can also be enlightening, Sharon. Um, yeah. Looking through those, uh, there's well, it, one in it, Bash and one in C shell. There's so many modules, you really do need to pay attention what your Intel version is and what modules you're loading, and that everybody's happy with everyone else. So it's yeah. It's, it's not just you can pick whichever library you want. They all need to work together. So it's important to understand what you're using. Mm -hmm. OK, we do have plenty of time for questions. Anyone, any questions from uh, anyone? OK, uh, I do have two questions more to Clarify, help me understand. Okay. Uh, Kyle, what is TCL and RUA actually? Lua. Oh, uh, um, those are the two different popular module um, ways to write module files. They're languages. Uh, Lua. So that's like Hera, uh, Hera and Orion. They use Lua module files. Uh, the Tickle or TCL modules, those are used on like WCOS Cray and some of the older machines. It's just two different ways to write module files. Lua is LMOD and Tickle is, uh, I forget what the module, what the, you know, the system name is called, but just two different ways of writing modules, different syntax, different language. Okay, uh, when you release the NSAP leaves, did you provide both modules, so the user only download the modules and install that. They don't really need to short code and recompile everything. Is that what this module for, or you? Yeah, that's it correct. Through? It's just if if you're on a machine that has tickle module files, it'll it it installs the modules for you. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, you don't have to do uh, okay. anything. Okay, that's good to know. <laughs> And uh, I, I, because from my personal experience, uh, NSAP lives is a black box for yes. most of users. Mm -hmm. But uh, if we want to make uh, the system portability, or NSAP system, if we want to make portability, NSAP module is the most uh, difficult part to port <laughs> to multiple platforms. So we have to make sure that part is working very well on 
all platform, not all, most of platforms and multiple compilers, and then other piece of code seems actually uh, a little bit easier to port. And uh, you said you have a wiki page for this. Do you have, uh, okay, do we have uh, other like a forum help desk to answer questions if uh, any questions from NSAP relates yeah, to the NSAP lips? Yes, uh, we use GitHub issues. So if you go to GitHub and NSAP libs uh, and you have an issue or something you want to bring up, we will, you know, we'll, we'll answer. That's that's our main uh, way of communicating is through GitHub. Okay, GitHub issues is the main way to get yes. help or answer issues, communication. Okay, uh, my last question is basically, I I know there's, I work with W3 library for many, many years. Uh -huh. I just always want to know why it's named with W3 because other libraries has clear purpose like BACIO, IP, buffer. Mm -hmm. But I, I just cannot figure out why W3 <laughs> library named like that. And I, I, I just have found this here. And yeah. I, anyone knows, actually. You know, I'm, I'm not entirely sure that's before my time. I know those codes are from, you know, the mid 90s. And uh, we're in the process of combining them. We have combined them. So we're going away with just having a single W3 library. Um, yeah, I don't know the history of it very much. I just picked up where I found it, basically. <laughs> OK, thank you. Yeah. OK, uh, one last call for any questions from everyone. <laughs> For Kyle. Okay, uh, if we uh, no more questions, and thanks, uh, Kyle, with this clear talk and uh, interesting <laughs> libraries, we all have to deal with that either with uh, either with as a black box or someone has to dig really out of these libraries to make it work. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you very much. Sure. And uh, yeah, let's uh, continue. We have another talk from EMC, and uh, George Gaynor will give a talk on pre-processing change rise uh, cube. And uh, uh, tell uh, George, when you're ready, please start. All right, can you hear me? Yes. All right, can you see my talk? Yes. Yes. Oops. All right, I'm uh, gonna talk about uh, the, the main pre-processing program and it's called uh, Change Res uh, Cube. A quick, quick summary here. Um, the medium range weather app provides options to run with the following uh, predefined global grids. And these are our global uniform grids. And they range in resolution from C96, which is about 100 kilometer, uh, to about uh, C768, which is about 13 kilometer. And uh, C768 is the uh, op is the resolution of our operational FV3 GFS. And for each of these uh, grids, um, the orography, land mask, and a number of other surface climatological fields are pre-generated. And uh, some examples of these surface fields include um, soil type, uh, veg type, uh, plant greenness, those sorts of fields fields that are, that are just static. Um, and these files are sourced by the same workflow in the uh, medium range weather app for supported platforms, or they're downloaded automatically from the EMC FTP site for unsupported platforms. And uh, just a note here that Change Res Cube constitutes the only pre-processing component that the user needs to configure and run. So, so what is Change Res Cube? Um, 
Well, I guess for, for those of you familiar with Wharf, and um, that does not include me, but for those of you who have experience with Wharf, uh, Change Rescue can be thought of as a combination of the, the Ungrib, MetGrid, and Real Executables. Now, the, the program is built around the Earth System Modeling Framework Library, and it's based on an older NCEP Spectral GFS preprocessor. And uh, for those of you um, from NOAA, you may realize, know that uh, this was our old uh, global change res program. So what it does is it reads in uh, uh, external model data, both uh, for the atmosphere and the surface from uh, several uh, GFS based files. It then interpolates that model data to the target FV3 grid for the initialization of the uh, FV3 model. And uh, what it does is it writes out net CDF files for each, each tile on the CubeSphere grid for the uh, surface and atmospheric uh, fields. Now the, the, the Medium Range Weather App includes Change Res Cube as part of the NCEP Libs installation. But if you're interested in trying to get the source code uh, on its own, it can be downloaded as part of the UFS Utils uh, GitHub repository. And the link there is, uh, um, you can get it at that link on GitHub. And the weather app uses the, uh, you'll find several different branches and tags there, but the medium range weather app uses the release public V1 branch. And the change res cube source code directory will be under uh, SORC and then change res cube.fd. Now code support uh, exists and it, the, the program is able to run on all NOAA HPC uh, boxes and also on uh, Cheyenne uh, generic Linux and Mac OS. So additional information on the repository uh, just please go to, to our wiki page. So what are the inputs to Change Res Cube? Well, there's a few of them that are uh, static. Uh, for example, um, it's a vertical coordinate definition file. And that's just a simple text file that defines the AK and BK coefficients that are used to compute the um, uh, vertical coordinate. Um, also, there is um, what we call our grid mosaic file and our grid files. So the grid files contain grid point, uh, lat lon, um, things like uh, grid point uh, area, distance to the grid box edges, that sort of information for each tile. And the mosaic file, what that does is it, uh, it uh, determines or lets you know how each tile fits together to form a cubic, to, to form a global grid. Also for each tile, uh, there are um, model orography files and they contain fields such as land mask, orography, and other fields uh, needed for the gravity wave drag parameterizations. And there are also several climatological fields, which I've alluded to before, things such as um, a maximum snow albedo data set, uh, soil type, uh, vegetation greenness, and uh, vegetation type. So all these files are in net CDF format and they're all based and they're all tiled based one file for each each of the six tiles now the program also needs external model uh, input data and it supports several types um, and there's a listing here um, now not all of these data sets are available uh, online and for, for those of you who are have no accounts and have access to HPSS, uh, the file types listed with there with an asterisk are HPSS only. Now the remaining uh, file types are available on online, 
Um, but for a few, there's only the most recent 10 days are available. But for other uh, data sets, um, you can, there's a, a longer time period. You'll have a few years of data to, to, to use. I'll explain a little bit more about that on the next slide. So given all these different uh, inputs, um, you're able to you're able to initialize a case going all the way back until May 21st of 2012. But that's only as long as you have access to the GFS V12 and V13 data. So a little more here about the external model input data. Um, first, we have a GFS Grid 2. There's a quarter degree version. Uh, last 10 days are available on our NCEP Nomad server, but we all, there's also half degree and one degree data available on the NCDC website. We also have GFS V15, um, which is our current operational model. Um, we have what we call our NEMS IO formatted file. These are on the T1534 Gaussian grid. And the last 10 days are available on our, uh, on, on our Nomad server as well. Um, GFS V16, we expect that to be implemented in early February. And once that happens, the uh, latest 10 days of um, T15 Gaussian data will be available. Then that will be in, won't be in NEMS IO, but it will be converted to NetCDF format. So the change risk cube that you have will be able to work um, once we once the GFS version 16 is implemented. Now for particular details on how you would set up the name list, the change risk cube name list for each input data site, um, I recommend you go to the uh, to the link here at the bottom. Um, it's a lot more detailed information about uh, change risk cube and and how it works. Um, for GRIB2 data, if you're using the GRIB2 data option, uh, there's something called a variable mapping table. And um, what this does is it controls how ChangeRes Cube handles variables that may be missing from the GRIB2 file. Uh, as I'll explain on the next slide, these GRIB2 files have, they don't have all the data that uh, the other data formats contain. So if there are missing fields, what the file does is, is you tell you tell change risk cube what to do. Uh, for example, do you want to um, uh, skip the read of the of something that's missing? Um, if it's not there, do you want to set it to a fill value? Or do you just want the program to stop execution? So um, if you, the, the varmap files under the parm subdirectory, and uh, the, the different columns in the uh, VARMAP file are, des are described here in, in more detail. Um, some considerations if you're using the GRIB2 data. Uh, it's not, the GRIB2 files don't contain all the fields. There's, there are some missing fields. And in particular, we don't have the fields needed for the near sea surface uh, temperature scheme. So there's a couple different options. The first is that you can just run the model with, with that particular scheme turned off, or um, there is a way to, to spin up the cycle, um, which is not really ideal, but it, it will work for you. Um, details on that, if you go to the, to the link I have highlighted, will show you how to do that. It, it's a couple different uh, name list options in the forecast model that uh, will allow you to, to run with NSST if you don't have any input data. Uh, also, I guess another, another consideration if you're using the group two data is it's relatively coarse compared to the other supported GFS data. Uh, the other GFS data is, is on the um, full resolution of the, the model, both uh, horizontally and, and vertically as well. So, um, so, you, so if it's available, if you have the other data sources available, you'll probably get a better initialization of your model. 
Also, the, the Grip2 data doesn't have certain fields like sea ice, sea lake ice thickness, and the sea ice uh, column temperatures. So fill values are used according to how you set that in the VAR map uh, file. Um, also, things like soil moisture in the Grip2 data, a lot of the surface fields are created using bilinear interpolation. So um, if you talk to a land person, that's kind of a no-no uh, because uh, you're getting a soil moisture that may be a mixture of values from, from different soil types. So that, again, it, it doesn't result in the best um, initialization of your, of your surface, uh, surface fields. Um, also, at atmospheric ozone is not available at all levels. So again, a fill value will be used according to how you set it in the VAR map file. Um, also, um, you can find a lot of, uh, on that NCDC website, you can find GFS GRIB2 data going back many years. Um, we've only tested the version 14 and version 15 GRIB2 data. So um, just a, a word of caution, if you go back, say, 10 years ago and try to use a group two file, it may not, may not work for you quite right, quite correctly. All right, so now what comes out of change rescue? Well, it uh, separate surface and atmospheric uh, net CDF files for each tile that are used to cold start the forecast model. So the atmospheric files contain fields such as uh, you know, surface pressure, temperature, winds, uh, various tracers, uh, such as specific humidity and cloud liquid water. Uh, the surface files have about 50 surface and NST fields, things such as uh, soil moisture, um, a land mass, uh, plant greenness, that sort of thing. And also some of the NSST fields required, uh, things like uh, there's a foundation temperature that the NSST uses. So there's about 16, 16 of the fields are used in the NSST. All right. Um, the way Changerous Cube is set up is the processing of the atmospheric and the surface and NST fields are, they're really just, they're fairly independent of each other. Um, and that's because the, the surface the processing of the surface fields is very much tied to the NOAA land model. Um, and the atmospheric uh, component is more, um, it doesn't, it's not as important where the, the atmospheric fields come from, but for the surface, there's a lot of special handling that does that's required for the NOAA model. So there are nameless options that allow you to determine whether the process all the fields at once or one at a time. So there's a couple of different nameless session set settings that can be defined as true or false if you wanna convert these particular fields or not. So, and this is use, useful for code development. And it's also gonna be useful for future limited area model capabilities, uh, because in that case, you'll need to create uh, atmospheric lateral boundary conditions for several time periods. So in that case, you would just want to convert the atmospheric only and not worry about the surface. All right, so the a brief overview of how it does the atmospheric processing, it, it's, it's similar to the old spectral GFS program or global change res. So it horizontally interpolates the external model data to the FE3 grid. Uh, it will then adjust surface pressure for terrain height differences between the input data set and the model grid, uh, reads that vertical coordinate definition file, determines the, uh, um, then it computes the 3D pressure on the grid, on the model grid, vertically interpolates from the in input data to the model hybrid levels. And the microphysics schemes that are currently supported include the uh, GFDL um, and our old uh, Zalcar uh, scheme. 
For the processing the surface, again, we use the NOAA land model here. So a lot of the algorithms used to process the data are very NOAA LSM specific. So, but the first thing it does, it will read in those static surface climatological fields on the FV3 grid, things such as vegetation type and soil type. Then it will interpolate uh, the fields, other fields such as soil moisture from the model, from the input data to the FV3 model grid. So it's a series of, of masked interpolations. You wanna make sure you're mapping land fields to land fields and non-land fields to non-land fields. There is a soil temperature adjustment for any terrain differences between the input data and the model grid. It'll also uh, recompute the frozen portion of the total soil moisture. It sets a roughness length at land and ice points from the vegetation type according to a lookup table. And it will also rescale the soil moisture. Um, and that's used for different soil types. You may get a, a, your input data set, uh, the, the, the nearest point may be uh, sand, but on the model grid, it could be something like clay. And uh, soil moisture is, is, is very tied to the soil type. So what we try to do here is if, you know, if you take a, a soil type from clay and apply it to a different soil type, you won't get a similar um, latent and sensible heat flux. So what we try to do is rescale it to try to preserve these latent and sensible heat fluxes. Uh, change risk cube, it's, it's, I tried to make it as modular as possible, built around uh, different Fortran modules. And I tried the name of the modules so that uh, you could kind of figure out what they do. So um, here's a list of the main ones. Um, there's a, a module here, program setup, which will read the name list, um, does other, sets up the program executable execution, computes some various soil parameters. Uh, there's a model grid module that sets the ESMF grid object, and that's for the external model input data in the FV3 model grid. And that's used so that the program can geo-reference the two grids. Uh, climato surface climatological data, um, that's read in through static data. And um, the atmospheric, I guess I didn't list that one. The surface processing is done in uh, surface.f90. There's also one called atmosphere.f90, which I don't have listed which, uh, which um, processes the different atmospheric fields. Uh, I guess I'm brief, uh, briefly about uh, code contributions. Um, you're always welcome to tinker with the code, but you must do so under your own fork of the repository. So clone the UFS utils repository, create your own fork, and um, you can make your, make your changes there. Um, code management, we do follow the Git flow protocols. And if you don't know what that is, I have some references on our wiki page. Um, so the way we do it here is that the main line of development is the develop branch. So any, um, any new feature you wanna to add to the code uh, by our convention, we create what we call a feature branch off of develop. And it's important that once you create a feature branch that you keep it up to date with the develop under the authoritative repository because that can change, um, in some cases it can change daily. And if you don't merge the latest, develop, the latest updates from develop frequently, your, your merging can become, can become a nightmare. Um, now, if you do find a bug fix or come up with a great change that um, improves the, our model or change that supports current or future NSEP operations, uh, let us know and you'll be given priority for inclusion into the authoritative repository. Now, prior to all code merges, we do require a set of, we do have a set of regression tests that must be run on all our NOAA officially supported machines. And there's about eight different tests right now. 
that tests all the different configurations and different input uh, data types that change risk cube will use. So we just want to make sure that any change does no harm. And again, for more details, please, please see our, uh, the wiki page on UFS utils. Uh, additional documentation uh, in relate with, and this is specific to the medium range weather app release. You'll find very, you'll find here, and it's a lot of good detailed information. All right, and with that, I have um, I'm done. And are there any uh, questions? Okay, uh, thank you, uh, George. Seems there are no questions so far on Slack. So if there are any questions uh, from uh, uh, listener, uh, please unmute yourself and ask. I it have... looked like there was a question also in Zoom. Just wanted to let you know me. I have a question no. concerning the variable resolution option oh. that F33 has. Is ChangeRes uh, supporting that? Uh, could you say your question again, please? So FE3 provides variable resolution option, a stretched grid or nested grids. Is ChangeRes supporting such unusual or non-uniform resolutions? Uh, it, it will, as long as um, it'll take any uh, set of grid files and mosaic files. So, um, oops. Oh, sorry about that. Um, yeah, it'll take any, any um, it'll work. I, I tried a few years ago, I tried it with a global stretched grid. Mm -hmm. um, it ran, it was a fairly low version. Uh, there's a lot of noise along the boundary. So I wasn't sure if that was a problem with change res or if I just didn't have the model set up properly. But we know it works with uniform and it also works with standalone nests as well. Okay, actually we do have a question from Zoom group chat. Uh, Bob, do you want, uh, I think uh, Jeff answered, but uh, let's ask uh, <laughs> again. Uh, so uh, let's see. Bob, do you want to ask? Okay. Uh, let me see. Uh, actually, this question is very interesting and does relate it to a uh, lot of people. The question is, uh, what role does the microphysics scheme choice play in change rise? Or where you only point out that UFS has those options. So yeah, I actually, yeah. Did you, the, the first one is clear, but the second one is not clear to me. <laughs> okay. Okay, did you see that? The in Zoom group chat? Right, I guess the, um, let me see. I have so many windows open, I can't keep track. <laughs> Uh, I, the, the way change res handles microphysics schemes is it just um, you just tell it what tracers you want it to process. So if you have um, um, you know, current GFS data, which has all the tracers you need for GFDL, you you can tell you just tell ChangeRes to process all the ch all the tracers you need for that particular microphysics scheme. Um, it doesn't it doesn't create um, like if, if your input data doesn't have if you if you want to run with say a microphysics the the GFDL microphysics scheme but your input data doesn't have all the tracers you need. It doesn't, it doesn't create these tracers for you. It only uses what's available from your input, um, from your input data. I don't know if that's the question you're asking. Okay, uh, I think uh, Bob said yes, thank you. And uh, 
I need more questions from everyone. This is, this is Sharon. I have a quick question. Um, your the file that specifies your vertical coordinate with the AKBKs for the sigma levels. Um, the documentation and it says just levels and it doesn't say that, is it really the interface AKB case? Cause it seems to be for a 64 model, you know, levels, you really have 65 is what the file name is. So just you're, you're, you're right, it is, it's the interface. Okay, and that's true for any vertical resolution. It's really, you want the interface. Cofer. That's correct. Okay, thank you. I have another question, Ms. Christiana. So when we in independently interpolate temperature and pressure and wind and topography, we probably create gravity wave noise once we start the model. Can you comment on that? So is, is a dynamic balance interrupted severely um, after, we, after we interpolate? Um, we... We had some a, a group out in uh, in Boulder, uh, Jeff Whitaker's group. Um, they were able to. Um, you, you do get some gravity waves coming off the high terrain. Um, they they came up with a um, a way to when we do the when we interpolate the surface pressure, it's done using log pressure, and there's also a a lapse rate a standard lapse rate involved. And they found that that helped reduce um, a lot of the gravity wave drags, or any any help reduce gravity waves coming off, uh, say, high mountains. But yeah, I, that that's always going to be an issue. But we haven't had any problems with um, that I know of that of model of the model blowing up because of it. Um, Another related question. So if you go from your input grid to a final resolution, how is the topography handled? Are you still interpolating from the course input file to the final resolution? So you are actually not improving the shape and the peak of the mountains? No, the, the, going... terrain, the terrain is, pre, is pre-created for you. Um, so each resolution of the model has its own set of orography files. So. If you're using the C768, if, if you're creating a C768 uh, run, you're using C768 uh, model terrain. But then how would you go about the variable resolution, which isn't pre-created, the topography in these? Um, well, you have to have... Well, right now it, we only it only we only support those those four particular grids. Is there a way for the user then to create the topography? There will be um, the, and I think other talks will will talk about this. But the this particular re release does not contain the grid generation programs, but subsequent releases will. So you will be able to create your own grids. But right now, right now, we only officially support those those four global uniform grids. Okay, uh, I do have some questions to clarify. Uh, the first one is that uh, variable map. You mentioned that including the fields that uh, you can assign the missing value or decide if it's a stop or skip. Is that the full list of all the fields you need or it's just a, a, a subset of the fields that you need? I believe the one we provide, um, uh, gosh. I'm not as familiar with the var map file. Is Jeff? Are you on the line? Can you ex maybe explain that better than I could? Yeah, George um, Ming. The var map table um, is has a list of the variables that are required for 
initialization based on whatever your physics scheme is that you're using in, in the model. So um, there, depending on what physics suite you just des you decide to use, there are more or fewer variables that are required in initialization time. And so the critical ones are listed there. There may be others that um, uh, the choice isn't there, but the, the critical ones are there uh, in order to initialize the model. And then you, you either decide whether you want to fill it in uh, with the fill value um, or uh, the ones that are absolutely required that you have to have, you should set those to stop um, uh, unless the physics suite uh, can handle a specific fill value for that variable. So they are based on the suite definition file that you you use. So there are multiple var, var map tables um, currently uh, that you can choose from. And uh, I can speak for the short range weather app on how we handle that. Um, you know, it chooses which var map table based on whichever suite definition file you choose uh, when you when you build your your workflow. I, I don't know how that's handled in the medium range weather app though. Okay, so we do have we do need multiple wire map files for different physics. The suite. way yeah, the way things are handled right now, um, yes, there is a single var map table for each uh, suite definition file. Yeah. Does this related to also the input file like uh, wrap her or GFIs or NAM? I mean, uh, the the settings that you apply are more or less specific to the external model data because uh, you will either have or you won't have the specific uh, variables or the fields tracers that you need for that suite definition file. So you would set your uh, settings for each variable specific to whether that field is, is available or not. So yes, the, the, it does play into what you set those um, entries to. Yep. Okay, uh, thank you. Actually, uh, another question is maybe not only related to the change rise. It's basically, uh, I think we, we in this talk, uh, George, and you talk a lot of NSST. I assume that's pretty important <laughs> sea surface uh, uh, fields actually in global, uh, especially for the long-term uh, forecast. But uh, for GRIP2 file, we don't have initial SST information there basically that means we filled NSST with missing value, right? Um, well, let me, let me if you don't run with the NSST option, it doesn't mean that you're not running without, um, without, without an ocean. So I don't know if, so I don't know if that's that's the question. You, yeah. you run without the NSST, you still have an ocean and you still have a constant, you just have a constant SST during your your forecast integration. The the NSST is a it's a it's a physical model that tries to uh, predict the diurnal um, evolution of the sea surface temperature. So that's what you would not be running with. But yeah, again, we, have a talk. we have a talk. Uh, uh, next, a uh, CCPP partner will introduce that. Okay, great, Lini. Yeah, because this, I, I think this is pretty important uh, that uh, uh, we should know actually how this NSST or how surface deals with, or maybe how the model handle all these missing values from the grip two. So it, it's really help us to understand the results. <laughs> yeah, we are talking okay, about. Okay, thank you. So we do have uh, more time for discussion or question or comments and uh, please speak up if you have comments, questions. I guess I can ask a question. Uh, what a, so you mentioned that uh, older GRIB2 input and older model input may not work properly. Is this just a matter of uh, finding the correct settings to put in like the variable tables um, or is it kind of a more fundamental difficulty that would require code changes and things like that um, if you wanted to kind of get into older model data or even like reanalysis data right well i guess the older the older model data 
it, it seems like every every implementation we do here at NSEP, we we always change the files around. So um, variables that you have um, in the current files may not be available if you go back a couple years. Um, and it may be, uh, who knows, it may be a variable that's that's really critical that um, that maybe the farm app table can't can't fix for you. I don't know, but I think that's that's my that's that I guess that's my main concern is that just that the file the contents of these files can change uh, greatly with each implementation. And if we go back ten years and and look at a file, there may be things in there that that there may be so much missing data or so much different data that it just may not work without code changes or uh, big changes uh, to the var map table. Of course, it could work that as well. Okay, thanks. Yeah, Mike, it, I ju I'll just add that it's, there are so many mappings that have to take place based on your external model data and what the physics suite that you're using require, it becomes extremely difficult to try and add support for a new model unless um, it's very similar to what we had currently have supported in Change Rescue. Um, so that's that's something we ran into when we were trying to add support for the regional models that exist. So. Uh, hello, I have a question. Can you hear me? Please go ahead, David. Yes. Um, it seemed yesterday that uh, it was mentioned that uh, GFS only at resolutions of a half degree and one degree would be usable in this uh, UFS app. But uh, today in your presentation on the GFS uh, or in the change risk cube, it, uh, you mentioned the quarter degree GFS was available or could be used. I'm, so I'm confused if it is or is not usable. It yeah, quarter degree is available, but only the last 10 days worth. The half degree and one degree data there, um, is available on, on an NCDC website for multiple years. So you can use the quarter degree, but only the last 10 days, and it's on a different server. Okay, but if we have our own uh, archive of quarter degree uh, and we were running it on our local system, we could figure out a way to, to use it. Yes, if you have your own uh, quarter degree database, then uh, you can certainly use it. Great, thank you. Okay, so Changerize can automatically define or identify which resolution of from uh, which resolution the group two file is, right? So there, there's a no configure or anything change, just link the group two file, it will know, right? Yeah, it, it gets the um, grid information from the, the GRIP2 header. So it, it should automatically know um, the, the resolution of your input data. OK, thank you. Uh, any more comments, questions? OK, uh, let me ask two quick questions. <laughs> If after this, there's no more comments, questions, we can certainly have an early break. So we have more time to to relax. Uh, one is actually very quick. Uh, GFS 16 will be operation early next year. So this change rights we are talking about uh, basically will be used in that operation, right? Or similar. Yeah. Or the change res cube is that's part of the public release can can ingest version 16 uh, net CDF files. So when those are finally available, it should it should work without any modification. Okay, yeah, okay. So I I, I, I certainly confused. Okay, the global is continuous cycling. Okay, it, it does not need change rise, right? Operation. All right, you, you, you said what, continuous cycling? Uh, oh yeah, global GFS is continuous cycling. So it's it does not need change rise during the cycling. Uh, th yeah, that's that's correct. Um, um, 
in our operations, we don't use change res because once you, well, unless you, unless you cold start a, a, an experiment, but once you get the global uh, system up and running, it, it doesn't use change res because it just feeds off itself. Okay. Yeah. And uh, uh, my second question is actually, uh, you, you mentioned that uh, there are the terrain adjustment vertically uh, to the atmosphere. Uh, could you uh, give us more details about how you do the two meter temperature, two meter moisture and 10 meter wind? Does this uh, adjust based on, because there's always difference between the input global model and the maybe high resolution terrain you are trying to justify it. So can, we, can you give us more details about how you do this surface, near uh, surface fields? Well, we, we don't do anything special near the surface. We just, we, we, know the, we know the pressure levels of the input data, and then we know the pressure levels on the FE3 grid. And from there, we just do a, a vertical interpolation using a, a cubic spline type method. Okay. Uh, if it's below the model surface, are you going to do extrapolation or still use, using this kind of interpolation right. method? It, it will do below surface. I, I believe we just assume a standard lapse rate for things like temperature. And if it's a, if it's above the, it, and if it, uh, if it's above the model top, I believe it's just a simple, simple persistence. It's not very sophisticated. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it's very complex process to make it right. <laughs> thank you. Okay, so one last call. <laughs> okay, so. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead, Zhao Xia, we can hear you. And just to follow Min's question about the, uh, this uh, two meter temperature and the 10 meter when you say that you do the interpolation. So to my understanding, usually this type of sense uh, based upon the boundary uh, scheme, so the similarity theory or other sense will be applied to derive the two meter temperature. <laughs> right, yeah, change res cube doesn't apply uh, anything like similarity theory near the ground. So you say that, so it's, you only apply the interpolation? Right, that's that's correct. It's just a it's just a straight interpolation from one pressure set of pressure levels to another. Okay, thank you. Okay, uh, I think uh, we have very great discussions this morning, and uh, we do actually uh, have. 15 minutes more break. Uh, so uh, the next section, we'll talk about the CCPP and uh, it will start at 10.45 AM uh, US Mountain Time. So uh, thank you and uh, let's res uh, resume this uh, uh, training at 10.45, thank you.
Okay, uh, good morning again, everyone. It's uh, 10 45 a.m. U.S. Mountain Time, and uh, this uh, let's start the second session of today's training. Uh, this uh, this session we will have two uh, talks uh, from DTC CCPP group. The first one is from uh, Grant Fur, and uh, his talk is uh, over overview of the CCPP. Uh, this is a recorded presentation. Uh, the grant is with us and uh, can answer questions after the talk. Oh, uh, let's start it. Let's start, thank you. Okay, thanks Ming. Uh, this is Grant. Um, like Ming said, uh, this is a CCPP overview. This is more of the, the nuts and bolts uh, of how the CCPP works. Um, and the presentation following by Linlin Pan will get more into uh, the scientific aspects of the CCPP physics. So, uh, and like like Ming said, uh, I'll be around after the pre-recorded presentation ends to uh, answer questions. Okay, thanks. I'll go ahead and play. In this presentation, I'll be providing a high-level overview of the Common Community Physics Package, or CCPP. A large number of folks have contributed to the CCPP in some way. It is a community effort after all, but the folks listed on the slide are those who have perhaps spent the most time on this project within the DTC. I'm Grant Furl and will be presenting this material, but a lot of credit should be given to Dom Heinzeller, Lija Brenner Day, Laurie Carson, Man Zhang, and Julie Schramm. In this presentation, I hope to provide at least cursory answers to the following questions you may have about the CCPP and how it relates to the wider UFS. First and foremost, what is the CCPP? Then I'll discuss how it fits within a modeling system in general, and specifically the UFS. Next, I'll discuss how parameterizations are assembled into physics suites to run within the UFS. Following that, I'll provide some details about what is special about a parameterization to be used within the CCPP, and how the UFS, or any model, needs to provide information about the data it provides to the physics. Finally, for context, I'll step back and provide a brief history of this project and where it currently is being used, and then talk about where this project is going in the short term, and by extension, how these plans might affect the UFS. First, I'd like to start out with the genesis story of this project or what motivated the CCPP to be born in the first place. And it starts with a set of goals for UFS physics that were defined by NGGPS leadership. First, there should be a consolidated library of physics routines that can be used for both operational and research needs that are suitable for all UFS applications. Second, this library should be well supported and be accessible to the weather and climate community. Third, the library should be open and follow community-oriented development practices, such as utilizing Git for version control and GitHub for sharing code and coordinating development. Fourth, each physics scheme should have a clear, well-defined interface that is also well-documented. This should facilitate using and enhancing existing parameterizations, as well as providing a target or a template for new parameterizations to follow. Fifth, Physics schemes should ideally be interoperable in the sense that they should be usable across many die cores. This should ultimately lower barriers to scientific exchange, with respect to physics anyway, across organizations, much like standardization of mechanical parts, electric building codes, or countless other examples in modern society. So the CCPP was created in an effort to meet all of these goals. The CCPP has been organized into two distinct software repositories, both of which exist on GitHub. The first is to house actual physics parameterization routines, their interfaces to the CCPP, and all dependencies. Its master branch contains the latest UFS operational physics, as well as candidates being considered for future operational implementation. Public releases are typically cut from this master branch, with a subset of its parameterizations enjoying support to the community with ample documentation and cross-platform testing. Other branches under the authoritative fork can contain parameterizations under active development, 
and other third-party forks exist to house CCPP-compliant parameterization development from other institutions. In addition, the CCPP physics repository can also contain Git submodules itself when a scheme's authoritative repository is under the control of a third party. The second software repository houses the so-called CCPP framework. It consists of scripts and tools that form a generalized software framework for connecting a set of physics parameterizations with a host application. This framework is designed to be model agnostic, and its use and development is shared across several institutions. Typically, the host model would need to use both of these repositories, and the UFS has both as nested submodules under the FE3 submodule. Now that we know what the CCPP is in a broad sense, let's get into how it works within a generalized host model and inside the UFS. In this diagram, the atmosphere driver box represents the main calling program. Perhaps it is the DICOR in some models, or perhaps it is another software layer, but it is typically responsible for time integration, calling all connected components, and maintaining a model's state. The CCPP physics on this diagram corresponds to the CCPP physics repository, and as shown, is a collection of physics parameterizations with potentially more than one of each type. For example, several different microphysics schemes, convection schemes, etc. One of the keys of the entire CCPP is that each of these physics schemes will have an associated file containing metadata. We'll get into the details of what this metadata looks like in a minute, but in short, it contains information about what variables a physics scheme needs to perform its function and its output. It is a complete description of its data interface in a way that the CCPP framework can understand. Likewise, on the host model side, there must be similar metadata files in a special format that describe what variables it can provide to the physics and how and where it exists in the host's data model. At model build time, the CCPP framework scripts are invoked to read metadata from the host and metadata from the physics to construct or auto-generate a software cap that acts like a custom-made physics driver. At build time, the CCPP framework must also be given a description of the physics suite or suites for which to construct one or more software caps. The description of those physics suites is accomplished through suite definition files or SDFs. Each suite should have its own SDF and they may be host model dependent and stored in the host model software repository. Each SDF is an XML file with a schema that uses the following hierarchy. The top level element is the suite, which defines the suite's name and carries a version attribute that corresponds to the version of the XML schema file. Underneath the suite element are one or more group elements. All schemes contained within a group will be called together in sequence. Importantly, however, the group elements allow for non-physics code to be executed between groups. This can provide all kinds of flexibility for various physics dynamics coupling or for any other functionality a host model needs to call in between physics groups. Within each group, the next element is called subcycle. This element controls how many times each scheme within is called. While this is typically one, this can be useful to call a set of physics at a shorter time step or to implement an iteration. The finest grain element is the scheme itself, which contains the name of a scheme as a string. To make this information a little more concrete, let's look at the SDF for the operational GFS version 15.2 suite. Notice the four different elements and how they're arranged. We see the top-level suite tag that names the physics configuration, several groups within that top-level tag, several subcycle tags within groups, and each scheme to be called by its name. Since the suite is split into five groups, this allows for the host model to perform other operations between the execution of the groups. For example, in this suite, the fast physics group is part of the GFDL microphysics scheme that gets called from within the die core for tighter coupling with the dynamics. The die core finishes its execution in between the fast physics group and the next physics group. Also, 
The subcycle functionality is used to create a two-step iteration for the surface schemes. Notice that the subcycle element encompassing the surface-based schemes has a loop equals two attribute, whereas other subcycle elements have loop equals one, signifying a single execution. Another thing to note is that the CCPP framework creates caps for both the entire suite as a whole and for individual groups. This allows host models the flexibility to call the entire suite at once if no computation is needed in between groups, or with more granularity by group. For example, the CCPP single column model uses the entire suite cap, whereas FV3 in the UFS medium range weather application calls the group caps. Lastly, one may notice that within this suite, there are many more schemes than one might expect. There are on the order of 10 subgrid scale physics processes that are typically parameterized, yet there are more than 50 schemes to be executed in this suite. Why is this? So this brings up an important distinction. The CCPP does not organize schemes by type. That is, there are no predefined categories like microphysics, convection, radiation, etc. that a scheme must fit into. As long as a piece of code complies with the rules to be discussed in a bit, it doesn't really matter what is inside. This allows for glue code, typically found in a traditional physics driver, to be fit into a CCPP suite. We call schemes that fit the traditional definition of a physics scheme, code that parameterizes some subgrid scale physical process, a primary scheme, and schemes that contain glue code as interstitial schemes, or code that fits in between the primary schemes. These interstitial schemes perform functions like data preparation and diagnostics that allow primary schemes to function together as a suite. These are often host specific. For example, if the UFS medium range weather application expects that a specific diagnostic be calculated for output, but it is not calculated within a primary scheme, an interstitial scheme is employed to do so. In the extreme case where all diagnostics are handled by the host application outside of physics, and all primary schemes used within a suite provide exactly the data needed by a subsequent schemes, a SDF could be constructed of entirely primary schemes. To the extent that a SDF uses many interstitials, this signals that there is a lot of diagnostics and or data laundering going on. So far, we've discussed what the CCPP is, how it fits within a host application and within the UFS, and how a physics suite is defined. Next, I'm going to discuss what is special about a scheme that works with the CCPP, or what makes a scheme so-called CCPP compliant. I'll first mention the attributes of such a scheme on this slide, and then go into each in more detail in subsequent slides. In short, it's mostly about the scheme's interface. First off, the scheme's code must be contained within a Fortran module. Further, within that module, there should be three subroutines that share the name of the module, but for the initialization, run, and finalization phases. For example, if the scheme module is called foo, Three subroutines within should be called foo underscore init, foo underscore run, and foo underscore finalize. The init phase is executed once at the beginning of a model run, and the finalize phase is executed once at the completion of a model run. The run phase is called at least once every physics time step. It is allowable for some of the subroutines to be empty should the associated phase be unnecessary for the scheme. Most importantly, and the fuel that drives the CCPP is metadata. There should be metadata describing all arguments to the non-empty special subroutines. This is key. Other requirements are special error handling characteristics, adherence to modern coding standards, and scientific and technical documentation using Doxygen markup. Now, let's take a look at an example CCPP compliant scheme's code structure. First, Notice that the code exists within a Fortran module and that the required subroutines with the special names exist within. They share the root module name with init, run, and finalize appended. Note, be sure to label the end statements for both the subroutine and module. Another thing to note is that for non-empty interface subroutines, there is a special Doxygen formatted hook. 
This does double duty as a signal for the CCPP framework parser and as an insertion point for an automatically generated HTML table for the generated scientific documentation. It is important that these lines exist for proper execution of the CCPP framework. Speaking of metadata, let's dive into what this looks like in detail. A scheme's metadata is placed into a separate file with the same root name, but with a .meta extension. The metadata file serves at least three purposes. The first is to provide information to the CCPP framework about what data the scheme needs as well as what it outputs or produces. The second is to serve as documentation for scheme arguments. The third purpose, and which is new for CCPP version 4.1, is to provide information to the CCPP framework about the scheme's build time dependencies. Looking at the file contents, it uses a relaxed config file format with defined sections for each subroutine in the Fortran code with a CCPP compliant interface. Each section begins with the name of the subroutine and a type that describes what kind of entity the metadata is describing, in this case, a scheme. Afterward, all variables that are part of a subroutine's argument list are included, with attributes for each variable following. Let's look at the kind of metadata that is expected for each variable. First, we have the local name of the variable as it is known in the argument list of the subroutine in brackets. Following that is perhaps the most important piece of metadata, the variable's standard name. This is a unique identifier for the variable and is how the CCPP knows or tracks a variable. Every CCPP scheme that uses a given variable and every host that provides a given variable should use the same standard name. These standard names are based on the CF conventions, although the CCPP is in the process of extending these guidelines for our use. A well-defined set of rules for constructing new names is under development. Afterward is the so-called long name. This attribute serves more of a documentation role, especially if the standard name is insufficiently detailed. The units attribute is critical. The format is such that any exponents immediately follow the unit abbreviation. The next attribute is the dimensions of the variable. It is a comma-separated parentheses bound list of dimensions by their standard names. It can be an empty set of parentheses for a scalar variable. It can specify a start and end through use of standard names. Or if a standard name is given for the dimension, it's implied that the dimension starts with one and spans to the specified value. The type attribute corresponds to a variable's Fortran intrinsic data type or a derived data type name. Although derived data types are discouraged, especially for data that gets passed between schemes, they can be used in the CCPP, especially where they can remain internal to one scheme and any tightly associated interstitial schemes. In general, however, derived data types limit a scheme's portability due to the need for a host model to know about the type definition. The kind attribute is used to denote precision of a variable, especially reals or floating point values and character variables. The intent attribute is another critical one and corresponds to the actual Fortran argument intent for how a variable is used within. This can be in, in, out, or out. The last attribute listed is the optional attribute. This is either true or false and corresponds to whether the variable uses the Fortran optional keyword. Optional variables are discouraged and the CCPP may remove support for them in future versions. The last thing to point out about a CCPP scheme's metadata is a new feature that was just added in version 4.1 that you should be aware of for future development. There's a section called CCPP Table Properties that applies to the entire scheme, not just one subroutine within. It has fields for a scheme's name, the type, which should be scheme for all CCPP schemes, and a list of file dependencies to be used by the CCPP framework to inform the host application's build system. It is especially useful for compiling only those files that are necessary for a given list of suites, rather than all files within the CCPP. This section will be required for development using CCPP version 4.1 or later. 
Another factor that a scheme needs to take into account to be CCP compliant is its error handling. A CCP compliant scheme is not allowed to stop a host model or otherwise write out error messages. Instead, it should make use of the CCPP error message and CCPP error flag variables. If a scheme detects an error, it should set CCPP error flag to a non-zero value, set CCPP error message to a string describing the error, and return to the calling procedure. The CCPP software framework returns these error variables to the host model, who can then stop the model gracefully. Documenting a CCPP compliant scheme makes use of specially formatted in-source comments. These comments are parsed by the Doxygen software to produce human-readable content while being subject to version control along with the rest of the code. Although such documentation is not required for the scheme to work within the CCPP software framework, it is highly encouraged for developers to adequately document their algorithms for future maintenance and potential improvement. Detailed instructions for adhering to the desired format are included on the CCPP website, and many examples exist within the existing CCPP repository for format replication as well. Examples of the documentation produced can be found at this link. The documentation includes a description of the arguments, a high-level description of the algorithm, and often a detailed description of the algorithm with equations and references. To sum up the documentation component, CCPP schemes use Doxygen inline markup. These comments are typically additive to existing source code documentation, not necessarily a replacement. The metadata file that exists for each CCPP compliant scheme is parsed as part of the documentation generation process into an HTML table that is displayed in the browser readable output. The content of the documentation should give a user a good understanding of how the scheme works scientifically, or at least point the user to where they can learn about it. Although, in general, it is not the goal of the CCPP project to enforce a particular coding style or method, it is important that some minimum coding requirements are met. Following these requirements should aid future maintenance and portability of CCPP compliant schemes. Although examples of older standards of Fortran exist within the CCPP physics repository, new schemes should choose to follow the Fortran 90 standard up to the Fortran 2008 standard. Next, labeled end statements of modules and subroutines are required for proper parsing of the code by the CCPP framework. Also, using implicit none is required, preferably at the module level. If a variable is labeled as intent out, it must be set within the routine. In addition, variables that contain domain-dependent data cannot be kept using the save attribute. Further, goTo statements should not be used and common blocks are forbidden. Finally, as a reminder, schemes should not stop or abort the model and IO should be contained within the init subroutine, like for reading lookup tables. Please see the written documentation for further details including rules for parallel programming. So, in a nutshell, that is what makes a physics scheme, or any piece of code, CCPP compliant. But how does a host model like the UFS use the CCPP? In the next few slides, I'll discuss some aspects of how this works. For those wanting more details, Chapter 6 of the CCPP technical documentation linked here provides those. For this talk, I'll be discussing metadata on the host side use of the CCPP API to call suites or groups within a suite, use of parallelism within the CCPP, and what the CCPP framework is doing at build time. Just like on the physics side, the CCPP requires that metadata exist on the host application side. By ingesting both metadata from the physics and host, the CCPP framework is able to auto-generate the software caps that pass in the correct data to the physics. For the UFS, most of the host metadata exists in the GFS typedefs.meta file at the given path within UFS. Other files also have host metadata. For example, any Fortran modules that define derived data types will have an associated metadata file. There are a few differences between physics side metadata and host side. First, at the beginning of the metadata table, the type attribute should say module or DDT for derived data type, depending on the table's context. 
Second, the optional and intent attributes don't really have any meaning on the host side, so those are omitted. Finally, new for CCPP version 5.0, yet to be released, there is a new attribute called active that is set to a Fortran logical expression using CCPP standard names. Since some variables are conditionally allocated based on which physics schemes are actually active, this attribute lets the CCPP framework know under what circumstances the given variable is allocated and can be used within physics schemes. For example, some diagnostic variables are only calculated when a flag is set, so the active attribute for those variables would be set to an expression that evaluates to true when that flag is true. Next, let's talk about how CCPP physics are actually used within the host application. During the build process, the CCPP framework auto-generates an API for the host application to use, consisting of the calls on this slide. Note that all of these calls are suite-dependent. That is, they take a suite name and or group name as arguments. The auto-generated file is called CCPP static api.f90, and its placement in the source directory structure is controlled via the CCPP framework configuration. The CCPP init call should be called once and parses the SDF corresponding to the given suite name and initializes the state of the suite and its schemes. Likewise, the CCPP finalize call should be called once at the end of the time integration in order to deallocate data used by the CCPP physics suite. The other calls correspond to using the three phases of physics execution. The CCPP physics init call starts the init stage of all physics schemes in the given suite, in the order in which they appear in the SDF. The physics initialization stage is when functions such as reading lookup tables, reading input data sets, computing derived quantities, broadcasting information to all MPI ranks, etc. takes place. Initialization procedures are typically done for the entire domain, that is, they are not subdivided by blocks. Similarly, many, but not all, parameterizations need to be finalized, which includes functions such as deallocating variables, resetting flags from initialized to non-initialized, etc. This is the function of the CCPP physics finalize call. Initialization and finalization functions are each performed once per run, before the first call to the physics and after the last call to the physics, respectively. The CCPP physics run call is where the run stage of an entire suite or group within a suite is executed. These calls are placed within the time integration loop of the host application and are thus executed every physics time step. For the UFS, all of these API calls are written into an additional software layer found in a file called ccppdriver.f90 under fe3 slash ccpp slash driver, although some host models use the API calls directly in their code without the additional software layer. Next, you may be wondering about how the CCPP works with parallelized code. The CCPP was implemented with a couple of overarching paradigms related to parallelism. First, physics are assumed to be column-based only, and no communication between columns related to physics is expected during time integration. Second, physics initialization and finalization are independent of the larger threading strategy of the host application. So in practice, for MPI, this means that MPI communication is only allowed during physics initialization and finalization, and that should it be used for these phases, it should use an MPI communicator provided by the host application and not MPI COM world. For OpenMP, the time integration of physics, the run phase of each scheme, can be called by multiple threads. So threading is allowed inside a physics scheme, but it should use the number of OpenMP threads provided by the host application. If you've been paying attention up to this point, you've no doubt noticed that I've mentioned auto-generated code many times. All of this auto-generation happens at build time. Python scripts are at the heart of the CCPP framework, and they are invoked at build time. The scripts are given a set of suite definition files, as well as the location of metadata files from the host application and the physics. The scripts then read all scheme metadata for each given suite, read all host metadata, and match host-provided variables with physics-requested variables. 
The outputs of the scripts are the auto-generated suite and group caps, the auto-generated CCPP static API.f90 with definitions for all of the CCPP physics run, etc. calls, and auto-generated makefile information for compiling both the physics and the auto-generated caps within the host's build system. In the UFS, all of this happens behind the scenes as part of the build system, and users can happily remain ignorant of the details, although familiarity with the process may be important for development and debugging. At this point, hopefully you have a good idea about what the CCPP is, how it fits within the UFS, how physics suites are defined, what makes a piece of code CCPP compliant, and how the UFS uses the CCPP. The last few slides exit the realm of the technical and ascend to the programmatic to provide a bit more context. First, a bit of history. The CCPP is a relatively new project, having begun in earnest in 2016. It started with collecting requirements from EMC and NGGPS, discussing and refining them with the ESPC Physics Interoperability Group and the NGGPS Physics Workshop in 2017, and having them approved and signed by Michael Farrar and Fred Tepfer in October 2017. Design and development began around that time and continues through today. The first public releases, all of which included a simple single column model as demonstration, occurred in 2018 through 2019, although it was implemented within some versions of FE3 during this time frame as well. In 2018, we began the collaboration with NCAR and NRL, which is still ongoing to this day. In 2019, the CCPP was adopted by NOAA EMC for development, after which we conducted an in-person training the same year. Earlier this year, the CCPP was released alongside the first public release of the UFS Medium Range Weather app, with a minor update just last month. Of course, today is the UFS training, and the near future we'll see a UFS Short Range Weather app release with the CCPP. The CCPP is projected to officially be part of NOAA Operational NWP in the 2022-2023 to timeframe. As discussed in the previous slide, there have been several public releases of the CCPP since the spring of 2018. Each release provided a well-documented, multi-platform tested snapshot of the code, with support provided by either a help desk in the earlier releases or a forum in more recent ones. Typically, a small number of CCPP suites were officially supported, with many other CCPP compliant schemes provided for research and development. Since the CCPP requires a host application to work, it has always been released with a single column model to provide a simple example implementation. The first three releases officially were with a single column model only, yet versions 2 and 3 worked with developmental branches of the FE3 code on GitHub. Version 4, released this past spring, was the first to be publicly released alongside the FE3 via the UFS Medium Range Weather app version 1. The latest release, version 4.1, included mainly bug fixes and support for Python 3. The next release will be called version 5 and will be alongside the UFS Short Range Weather app version 1 release. Now, I'll briefly show the components of the currently supported suites, although more detail will be given in the next presentation. The suites supported in the UFS Medium Range Weather app version 1.1 are shown in the red box. The operational GFS suite, known as GFS V15P2 in this table, is the first supported suite using GFDL Microphysics, the K Eddy Diffusivity MaxFlux PBL scheme, GFS Surface Layer, Scale Aware Simplified Arakawa Schubert Deep and Shallow Convection, RRTMG Radiation, the Unified Gravity Wave Physics Scheme, the NOAA Land Surface Model, and Ozone and Stratospheric Water Vapor Schemes from NRL. The other supported suite, which is developmental, is known as GFS V16 Beta in this table and substitutes the moist TKE-based eddy diffusivity mass flux scheme for the PBL. The other suites in this table include many CCPP compliant schemes not mentioned as part of the UFS supported suites, but are available for research and developmental purposes. To provide even larger context than the UFS, 
The CCPP is slated to be used in some way by several flagship models from multiple institutions, notably including NCAR and the Naval Research Laboratory. The CCPP is well positioned to become a standard across modeling institutions. In my opinion, the extent to which the standard is adopted will dictate whether the dream of easily sharing physics across institutions, academia, and the broader community is realized. We think that the future is particularly bright for the CCPP in general, as we continue to foster relationships with institutions and organizations on the host model side, the physics side, and even the software framework itself. Part of this will be a more robust governance system for incoming physics and changes to existing schemes. For physics in the near future, we will continue to add new schemes as well as support others in doing so. We will also continue to help improve existing schemes, all toward the goal of improving UFS applications in general. As far as the near future for the CCPP framework, there are some exciting changes in the pipeline, including a transition to new CAP generation software that will better foster collaboration between NCAR and NOAA models, as well as several usability improvements, particularly a new function to track variables within a suite, like which schemes need a variable's input, where the variable is modified, etc. In addition, there is a need to create a new UPSI interface for CCPP suites that is currently unfunded, but will hopefully happen sometime soon. Finally, before the next CCPP talk, I'd like to draw your attention to more resources to learn more about the CCPP. First of all, you can read FAQs, post new questions, read solutions to previous questions, and interact with other users via either the CCPP or UFS forums linked on this slide. Second, check out some instructional videos posted on YouTube under the DTC's channel. Look for the CCPP playlist. More how-to videos may be added in the future should the demand be there. Finally, be sure to check out both the CCPP technical documentation on Read the Docs, as well as existing scientific documentation for the supported CCPP physics suites. Speaking of which, the next CCPP presentation will provide more details on the scientific aspects of the supported suites. Okay, this is uh, Grant back live. Uh, that's the end of the presentation. Um, I suppose we are ready for questions and I, I don't know how much time we have for that uh, before we need to go on to the next CCP presentation, but uh, um, Ming, do you know if there are any questions? Uh, we have seven minutes left and uh, there are one question from Steve Penny. Uh, do you want to make more comments in addition to Ling Ling's comments? Can you see the, what's that, chat group? Yeah, Zoom group chat. If you push, click the participants, and there is a group chat. Did you see that? Um, let's see here. I see the participants. Where's, where's the chat? OK. Yeah, okay, so let's see. Uh, Steve, can you unmute and ask your questions? Yeah, I was curious on slide 21, you mentioned that physics schemes are column wise and there was no interaction with the dynamical core. Is that true of all the physics schemes uh, that are used here for the UFS FE3? Or is there any capability uh, in in the package for integration of physics schemes with the uh, time dimension? Um, I, I, at first I thought you, the question was referring to like three dimensional physics and in, in which case the answer is, is uh, no, not at the moment. All, all physics are assumed to be column based, like I said, and, and that is the case for all uh, currently supported physics. Um, I, I, I'm a little bit confused by, by what do you mean by integration of the time dimension? You, you mean like uh, uh, how tendencies are applied, for example? Sure. Um, you know, I, 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 I think in the physics suites that exist right now, there isn't a whole lot of flexibility for how that's done. Uh, the, the first half of the supported suites are... Um, uh, 
process split, meaning that they all see the same initial state and they all supply tendencies um, individually. And those tendencies are applied halfway through the physics. And then the last half of the physics suites that are supported are, are time split, meaning that they subsequently each uh, update the state that the next uh, parameterization sees. And at the moment, that's all hard coded, um, uh, more or less, in, in, into the, the suites. Um, however, um, at some point, uh, we would like to implement uh, a more flexible way to, to, to do that, to do the, the time integration, where, where you can say um, in the suite definition file exactly, do you want this scheme to be uh, process split or time split? And the framework would uh, apply the tendencies you know, intelligently as you go along. Um, but as of today, as of this release, uh, no. So uh, hopefully that answered your question. Yeah, thanks. Uh, Grant, maybe this leaves you, maybe I can add something also. I don't know if this question also pertains to calling physics from the DICOR or a closer integration between the physics and the DICOR. And we do have that flexibility. So the physics does not have to be called all at once, um, you know, during the physics time step. So the physics can be called from different parts of the host model driver meaning that it can be interspersed with other routines that are you know, part of the die core or called separately. So in the case of the GFDL microphysics, we do have fast processes that are closely integrated with the die core and that can be done uh, for other packages in the future as well. All right, thanks, Luigi. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. And, and one other point I forgot to mention in my answer was, uh, the subcycle capability. Um, so, so if you wanted to run, you know, a subset of schemes at a smaller time step for stability or, or what reasons you have, um, that's that's currently possible. But uh, it's not really used other than in, in the currently supported suites to do a a two step iteration for for the surface related schemes. But uh, Okay, great. And any more questions? Okay, uh, we do have a comments from uh, Bob Conrick. Do you want to speak or you want me to read? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, yeah, it's just a thank you from Bob Kong. Rick about, uh, I think he got really great help from CCPP team when uh, through the email and now it's through the forum, right? Okay, uh, so it, let's continue our talk. And uh, the next talk is also about the CCPP physics. It's from Lin Lin Pan, the, another expert in CCPP group that his topic is a scientific overview of supported physics suite. Okay, so please go ahead, Lin Lin, when you're ready. Yeah, so I can see you the hear me? slides. Okay, yeah. Okay. So you can, so you can I can hear you, line? yeah, and see your slides. Um, I apologize, are we not having a lunch at 11.30? Or is this a continuation? This is a continuation. Lunch will be at 12.15. Okay, thank you very much. Yep. Hello, everyone. I'm Lin Lin Pan from LoA GSL and the DTC. In this presentation, we'll give a scientific overview of supported physics suites. Uh, we Willy and I work together to get these uh, PPTs. The other causes include Nidia Benedet, Dan Handler, Grunfer, Jimmy Dudhill and Fang Li Yang. Presentation reflects processes and the parameterizations developed by EMC, GSL, NCA, PSL, GFDL, NIL, etc. Here is the outline of the presentation. Median range weather app 
V1.1 supported physics suites and physics related name list options are introduced at the beginning, followed by the time integration when physics suites uh, within the physics suites and the scientific overview of selected physics schemes is given in the end. Two suites are supported in current uh, MRW app V1.1 release. As Lydia already mentioned yesterday, uh, GFS V15 uh, P2, GFS V16 uh, beta. The main difference of these two uh, physics suites is the PBL. So one is uh, use KEDMF, the other use most TKE EDMF. When the NSST initial condition uh, is not sufficient, then a simple uh, ocean scheme is used called a SOS. So there are two variants. We'll talk about the details of the NSST letter. This slide, this slide gives the schematics of the direct connection of parameters in the model. For example, cumulus interact with uh, surface through the convective rain influence the re radiation through cloud fraction and uh, impact with uh, macrophysics through cloud determinant. Then cloud macrophysics can influence the radiance through cloud effect also uh, has impact on the surface through long convective rain. Then radiation interacts with surface through long wave and short wave radiation. Then surface interacts with PBL with latent heat release, sensible heat flux, and the surface uh, variable like T2, Q2, U10, and V10. Physics related lamp list options in the file input.nml include GFS physics, GFDL, cloud macrophysics, serious unified grid wave uh, physics, stochastic physics. Let's look at the time integration and the physics suites. The scheme related variables are computed use time splitting shown here in which the model state is updated between calls to the parameters. The yellow part <clears throat> it's uh, updated between, uh, the yellow part is called once per physics time step. The green part is called once per remapping time step. Then the blue part is called once per acoustic time steps. So the, for example, if we use uh, C70, uh, 796, the time step is 225 seconds. The slow physics is at the same time step, but for other physics uh, step can be 112.5 for acoustic time step, it can be 18.75. So we do have different uh, time step for different physics. The tendency from different physics processes are computed by parameterization or derived in separate uh, interstitial routines. Surface parameter realizations are invoked twice in a loop with the first time to create a gas, gas and the second time to produce the tendency. Here's the flow chart of the integration from dynamics, physics down to surface coupling and uh, uh, physics up then back to uh, dynamics. We can see uh, Macrophysics interact with dynamical very closely. Here is an example of suite definition file of GFS V16 beta physics suite. So 
uh, that it sub separate into two parts, processing, splitting, and uh, sequential splitting. Processing splitting means ver various parameterizations operated on the same model state. Sequential splitting or time splitting implies parameterizations are called one after another, and each parameterization operates on an updated model state. As mentioned in the previous slide, the first part of the physics suite is process splitting and include radiation, surface layer, surface boundary layer, orographic uh, wave drag, really damping parameterization. This flow chart is uh, sequential for radiation calculation and the radiation scheme is involved at a uh, number of uh, time steps. The second part uh, of the physics suite include ozone, stratospheric water vapor, deep convection, convective gradual drag, shallow convection, and the macrophysics parameterization. It is a uh, uh, sequential splitting or time splitting, the parameters are called one after another, and each parameterization operates on an updated model state. So this slide and the next slide give a list of detailed uh, physics uh, schemes. We'll go over all these uh, physics uh, schemes. Let's look at the radiation uh, scheme first. So RTMG V2.3 are used uh, in uh, this model. It includes a uh, major and minor absor uh, absorbing gas like water vapor, carbon dioxide, ozone, methane, etc. It interacts with resolved model cloud fields interacts with aerosols supplied by climatology. A Monte Carlo independent column approximation method is used to represent statistical unresolved subgrid clouds. The scheme includes gyro module, astronomy module, aerosol, gas, cloud, surface, short wave and non-wave radiation module. Let's look at the NRL ozone photochemistry scheme. The scheme used here based on the uh, NRL Ozone Photochemistry 2015. Here is the details uh, of the ozone mix ratio uh, equation. P is productive, L is uh, loss, then R is ozone mixing ratio, T is temperature, then overhead column amount. Monthly and mean, uh, lunar mean ozone production and loss rate per unit ozone mixing ratio were produced by uh, NIL CAM 2D model. So this part is uh, based on the climatology. So all the term with zero is come from climatology. Then you use first order Taylor series expansion then uh, to calculate the changes. Similarly, for stratospheric water vapor, we use a similar equation. It also based on the uh, climatology, uh, monthly and lunar mean water vapor production and loss rates. Then uh, calculate the uh, tendency. Now let's look at the low boundary conditions and the uh, coupling. Low boundary condition and the coupling include ocean representation, sea ice, 
the uh, parameterization, GFS surface layer scheme, and the land surface model. Here we use lower LSM. Now let's look at a uh, CFS layer surface C temperature or NSST uh, scheme. We mentioned a lot uh, in the previous talk. As we all know, SST is required in the uh, numerical weather system at a low thermal boundary conditions of LC heat flux. The SST analysis is produced independently and provided to the national uh, to the uh, numerical weather prediction system as an input. In the UFS MRW app, the SST can change because it is forced toward the climatology. So this is the equation used. So T0 is uh, given at the initial time, then you can force to the uh, climatology like 90 days, then also this uh, climatology. Then T prime W is the related to the solar thermal climate warming and uh, uh, T prime C is the uh, skin temperature of cooling. So here is the details of the how it's calculated. So in addition, NSST can represent the influence of diurnal thermal climate layer warming and the thermal skin layer uh, cooling. So warming and the cooling. Then let's look at the GFS sim simple ocean scheme, SOS. When the initial condition does not contain all the fields, then uh, we use a constant SST through the forecast. The SST can still change if it is affected by other process, processes or forced toward the climatology if the uh, climatology forcing is turned on. So uh, GFSCI scheme, uh, it may contain the dynamics part, ice transport, multiple ice thickness categories, including leads, surface albedo, vertical, uh, thermal dynamics. For the one dimension, it does not include the first uh, two items. So GFS is coupled with uh, a three layer thermal dynamic sea ice model produce, predicts sea ice, snow thickness, surface temperature, ice uh, temperature structure. Here is the schem schematics of three layer thermal dynamics sea ice model. In each grid box, the heat and the moisture flux and the albedo are treated separately for the ice and the, the open water. The GFS surface layer scheme is based on the morning of fourth similarity profile relationship to calculate the surface stress, softness, exchange coefficient as input for other parameterization, including landing uh, surface model. The formulation is updated with stability parameter constant uh, Z divided L in morning of similarity theory to prevent the non-atmosphere uh, system from being full decoupled. So here's the equation uh, used. Then the surface model driving by the atmospheric forcing provide boundary conditions of heat, moisture, and momentum to the atmosphere for weather and uh, seasonal prediction systems. LSMs close surface energy and the water budget. So we are uh, using LOA SM, uh, LSM here. So let's uh, go to the details of LOA LSM. LOA LSM, LOA LSM has four uh, soil layers, use soil, prognostic equation, surface energy, and the water budget equation for creating pro prognostic land states, including uh, 
surface uh, soil temperature and the soil moisture, canopy water content, slow pack water equivalent content, and the slow pack depth. Let's look at the PBL and the uh, turbulence schemes. As we all know, the 80s in the planetary boundary layer range from meters to uh, hundreds. So our model most time does not have, have such high resolution. The main task of a PBL scheme is to calculate tendencies of temperature, moisture, and uh, momentum due to vertical diffusion, turbulence through the column. There are two options in CCPP support suites for app V1.1. One is GFS hybrid added deficiency mass flux EDMF PBL and a free atmospheric turbulence scheme. The second is GFS scale aware TKE best moist EDMF uh, PBL and the free atmosphere turbulence schemes. So for example, the turbulence flux, you have a ED, a ED term and you have mass flux term. So let's look at the GFS hybrid EDMF PBL and the free atmospheric turbulence schemes. So it includes mass flux scheme for strong unstable PBL case by consider, uh, considering non-local transport by large ADs. The AD deficiency scheme for weakly unstable PBL by representing local turbulence mixing. So this uh, is mass flux. This term is ED term. A first order turbulent transport scheme for stable uh, PBL. Using PBL height and the similarity parameters, diffusion coefficients are updated for low level uh, below the PBL top and the levels above the uh, PBL with updated Richardson number dependent functions. If PBL is diagnosed as stratocumulus top, diffusion coefficient are modified. If the PBL is convective, so the core mass flux scheme. Now let's look at the GFS scale of well, TKE based EDMF PBL and the free atmospheric turbulence uh, scheme. An extended, this is an extended version of hybrid uh, EDMF uh, scheme. So the ED mixing strength is a function of a uh, prognostic uh, TKE equation. EDMF applied to all the unstable PBL, both weakly and strongly unstable PBL and to the stratocumulus top driving downdrafts. Enhanced buoyancy due to moist ideal Vertical process condensation. So that's why it's called a moist uh, skin. It has scale awareness for the grid size where the large turbulent uh, eddies are partially resolved, including interactions between TKE and uh, cumulus convection. So this is the uh, uh, schematics of the uh, scale awareness. H is the PBL height. Data is the greater scale. So when data is much larger than H, it it will uh, close to one. This means the function grid size dependent function S will close to one. So the mass flux will a uh, lot change. However, when you decrease the grid size, then the S will become uh, smaller. So the scale, different scale will have uh, effect on the mass flux. Here M is the mass flux, S is a grid size dependent 
then the A is the area like a uh, uh, square of the great scale. Then RU is defined here, so it's related to the uh, Z and H. So they are uh, connected uh, together through this uh, method. Now let's look at the gravity wave drag and the GFS really damping. Gravity wave drag, gravity waves are generated by a, a variety of sources in the atmosphere, including orographic forcing like uh, mountains or lone orographic uh, forcing like uh, convection, jet stream, other processes. So uh, gravity waves can imp impose a subgrid scale drag force on the atmospheric stratified flow, which leads to the to be parameterized to improve predictions, especially for cold season when both atmospheric stratification and the winds are strong. Really damping in, is also introduced uh, to mimic the viscose of friction dissipation in the atmosphere. Top lead model effects, for example, then also winter, summer, lunar wind drag in the stratosphere. Gravity wave includes two parts. One is orographic gravity wave. The other part is long orographic uh, gravity waves. The unified gravity wave uh, drag physics uh, or OWG parameter relation calculate uh, the effects of gravity wave produced by flow irregularities at the old space, such as the mountain and the valleys. So this is a, a equation for gravity wave stress. Rho is the density, U is the speed, uh, low, low, low level, uh, average speed. Then GFR is uh, a function related to the flow number. Delta X is grid increment. N is the Bronte Varicella frequency. So uh, there are two main components in our graph wave in the unified graph wave, uh, physics scheme V0. First, uh, calculate the subgrade scale mountain block mountain blocking. Second, uh, calculate orographic uh, wave uh, drag. Now let's look at uh, non orographic gravity wave drag scheme in the UGWP V0. Non gravity wave uh, uh, and a uh, non orographic gravity wave drag physics scheme parameterizes the effects of non stationary wave and result in uh, dynamic cost. There's non stationary oscillations with periods bounded by Coriolis and Brownian Vaisala frequency, typically horizontal scales from tens to seven hundreds of kilometers, are forced by the imbalance of convection and uh, from the jet dynamics in the troposphere and the low stratosphere. A modification of Sinoka 2003 scheme for NG, uh, NGW with non hydrostatic and uh, rotational effect for gravity wave propagations and the background uh, dissipations is used. Now let's look at the uh, uh, cumulus parameterization uh, schemes. Cumulus parameterization predicts the effects of such great scale convection. As we all know that convection is at the scale like, uh, for example, several uh, kilometers, but most time our model is like uh, uh, 10 or 100 kilometers, for example, uh, 13 kilometers for uh, most of the GFS models. So 
the subgrid scales not resolved, then the cumulative parameterization can uh, play a role in this kind of subgrid scale convection to parameterize them. There are two types of cumulus clouds that parameterization represents, shallow and deep. Both act to vertically transport distributed heat, moisture, and momentum deep convection uh, deep cumulus produced rainfall. Uh, well, the uh, well, uh, shallow cumulus typically does a lot of produce preservation, except for the uh, drizzle. So the convective parameterization continues to be a necessary and important component of many uh, NWC models for predicting across scales. Moist convective compromise subgrid scale mixture of updrafts and downdrafts. A convective uh, scheme needs to determine when, well, and uh, if the convective occurs using uh, called a trigger function. Vertical momentum, heat, and moisture transport and distribution based on a cloud model. Amount or intensity of uh, the convection using the closure assumption. Now let's look at the uh, GFS scale aware mass flux deep convection scheme. This is an updated version of the simplified Arakawa Schmidt SIS scheme with scale and aerosol awareness. It includes the cloud mass flux decrease with increasing grid resolution. Rain conversion in the convective abject is modified by aerosol number concentration. Closure is scale aware. Cloud-based mass flux based on quarter equilibrium for resolution greater than eight kilometer, but as a function of mean abject when resolution is smaller than eight kilometer. Working concepts from Arakawa and Schmidt, uh, but it includes modification, simplification from uh, Grail 1993. For example, saturated downdrafts and only one uh, cloud type. The scheme includes the calculation of cloud top with updated cloud model entrainment and detriment, improved convection transport of horizontal momentum, a more general triggering function, and the inclusion of convective overshooting. Now let's look at the GFS SIS best mass flux shallow convection schemes. It's also an updated version of the previous mass flux shallow convection scheme with scale and aerosol awareness that parameterize the effect of shallow convection on the environment. Similar to the uh, deeper uh, convection counterpart, but with a few key difference. For example, cloud-based mass flux is parameterized using a mean abject velocity averaged over the whole cloud depth. Low equilibrium, low query equilibrium assumption used for any grid size. Cloud model without convective downdrafts, shallow convection st starts at the level of maximum moist static energy within the planetary boundary layer. Cloud top confined to uh, below levels uh, where the pressure is 70% uh, of the surface pressure. Entrainment rates are larger than in a uh, deep uh, convection scheme. Now let's look at the uh, macro physics and the precipitation type. Uh, type. Uh, Diagloss, GF, GFDL cloud macrophysics uh, is used here. Then the GFS uh, precipitation type diagnostic scheme 
will be discussed. GFDL cloud microphysics scheme representation of the cloud microphysics is a key aspect of uh, simulation cloud. Uh, the major features in GFDL cloud microphysics scheme include a single moment, six categories, uh, six catalog, uh, cat categories, uh, microphysics scheme, then uh, phase changes and lat latent heat heating are embedded within the Lagrange to allow remapping in the FE3 dynamical, as we mentioned uh, in the beginning in the time integration schematic uh, flow chart. It can be produced more rapidly than the rest of the physics, so it interact with the dynamic core directly. Then the total moist energy is precisely conserved within the uh, cloud macrophysics. So uh, as we mentioned earlier, GFDL cloud macrophysics in, include six uh, species, cloud ice, cloud water, water vapor, snow, rain, hail, and all grapple. So the green line without latent heat release or absorption. Then the red line you have uh, with that in the heat release absorb. So let's look at the GFDL macrophysics cloud fraction in every three dynamic core. So cloud radiation interaction may occur even when the atmosphere is subsaturated. Here's the uh, equation for the cloud uh, fraction. We can see cloud fraction sigma depends on the mass of uh, vapor, liquid, solid water, as well as uh, uh, saturated uh, uh, specific humidity. It also depends on HVAR. HVAR is the horizontal subgrid variability. So it's, uh, we'll come to this variable in the next slide. It, it is a function of measure of the grid spacing. So it's uh, grid dependent. When the grid spacing is large, it allows fraction, a fractional cloud to occur at lower uh, mixing ratios. This assumes that even though the grid box is undersaturated, then there may be a fraction of the grid covered by clouds. So uh, scale awareness uh, in the GFDL cloud macrophysics. So as we mentioned in the uh, previous slide, the scale awareness is achieved by an assumed horizontal subgrid variability, HVR. So HVR uh, is directly proportional to the grid space. So AR is the grid uh, space or cell area. It has a uh, difference in the overland or over uh, ocean. So the D land and the D ocean uh, are base values for the subgrade variability over land and the ocean. Then the GFS precipitation uh, type diagnosis. The basic idea is it uh, diagnoses the type of precipitation by the uh, dew point profile and the temperature profile. So GFDL macrophysics scheme permits the prognostic surface precipitation to simultaneously consist of ice, snow, gravel, and uh, at the same uh, location. Hence, if the GFDL Macrophysics scheme is called the precipitation type at the surface is directly diagnosed from the explicit surface precipitation 
for example, ice, snow, or gravel, predicted by the scheme and the convective rainfall predicted by the cumulus scheme is surface temperature is below uh, zero. This is also an input for uh, the land surface uh, model. Now let's look at the stochastic physics. Uh, as we all know, finity computing resources limit the spatial resolution of numerical weather model and the small scale processes such as convection and the clouds are not properly represented. Numerical weather predictions rely sometimes quickly strongly, uh, uh, some, uh, strongly on the resulting bug formula representing of unresolved processes. Stochastic uh, physical schemes within numerical weather models have the potential to simulate the dynamic effects of unresolved scales in ways that conventional bug formula representing are incapable of doing. So uh, the stochastic physics includes uh, SKEB, SPPT, SHUM, uh, there also has other uh, surface uh, stochastic scheme, but we uh, only support this uh, three here. SKEB means stochastic kinetic energy back uh, scatter. Add wind perturbations to model state. Perturbations are random in space time, but uh, amplitude is determined by a smooth dissipation estimate provided by the dynamic core. It adjusts errors in the dynamics more active in the mid latitude. Uh, one example, for example, in the mid latitude, we also uh, we all know the storm track, uh, the jet stream interact with storm track. However, sometimes we are not clear how the uh, jet can influence uh, interact the storm track. This scheme uh, play an uh, important role in the mid latitude can reflect this some kind of sloppy area and the low frequency uh, interaction. Then SPPT, uh, stochastic perturbed physics uh, tendencies, multiply the uh, physics tendency by a random number between zero and two before updating model state. So the uh, mean value is one. One means low change. So uh, 1.5 means you uh, increase 50%. Uh, then 0.5 means you decrease uh, the magnitude. Uh, 50%. This scheme addresses error in the physics parameterizations, most active in uh, boundary layer and uh, convective uh, regions. Then SHUM means specific humidity perturbations. Multiply the low level specific humidity by a small random number each time step then attempts to address missing physics process most active in the uh, convective uh, regions. So this is a summary of CCPP supported uh, suites and the schemes. Uh, we uh, introduced all these schemes this, in this uh, very uh, short presentation. Um, Uh, acknowledgement, lots of people uh, contribute to the physics development. I uh, We listed the uh, name here, but uh, this is not a complete list. So uh, thank you. Questions? Okay, thank you, Lingling Ling, actually. It's very rich information here. We do have very active question and answer process through both uh, Slack and uh, and Zoom uh, chat. Okay, uh, I think uh, George has a question. Uh, do you want to speak? Uh, ask your questions and then let Ling Ling answer also. 
Yeah, so, so my question was about the transport on the I the sea ice. Yeah, because the models do, doesn't communicate with yeah with neighboring grid cells. So how you could do that within this uh, CCP? Uh, for one dimension, currently we don't have it. So that's why I put a star here, not included, yeah. The so load transfer for one dimension. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, Sui also has a question. Do you want to ask Sui or you are good with answer from Grant already. Yeah, yeah, I have uh, got some. I have got answer from Grant. So, but uh, I have a following following question for the um, say more like about the general idea of CCPP. Uh, so, like uh, from Lenin's talk, we can see there are also a lot of effort um, efforts in how to put different schemes like. Uh, which PBL to use, which net surface to use. And um, so a lot of um, balances in um, uh, uh, finish uh, suite. So my question is, um, how do you wait? Like, how do you think the importance in like op optimize the combination, the suite itself or the, uh, and the, uh, uh, Mm, scheme themselves. Like we have two ways to uh, improve the performance. One is uh, use uh, uh, good compilations of different schemes. And another way is to improve the scheme itself. Uh, I'm a clear state my question. Yeah, uh, my understanding is uh... For each scheme, when the developer develops the scheme, most times they will uh, provide you know uh, the best compilation for this scheme to have better performance. Then we can uh, put it into the system. Then uh, have lots of uh, test and evaluation. I see. Yeah, thank I you. I, I, uh, can I just add to the answer just a, a little bit? I mean, this is, it, it, in many ways, this is not necessarily a question for CCPP. Um, th this is something that, you know, NOAA EMC does all the time, right? They're, they're, they're always uh, improving existing schemes and testing them against new different, you know, schemes that do stuff in different ways. And, you know, waiting whether... Uh, a scheme is, it, it, you know, produces a better answer or is more physically realistic or something versus how that manifests itself in the larger forecasts performance. Uh, that's something that they deal with every day and are, are constantly trying to balance that. So, um, yeah, it, it, it's a lot, lot, lot larger than the uh, CCPP. I see. Thank you. Yeah, uh, Siwei, I would also add that, you know, there's this concept of uh, hierarchical testing uh, with, and development, which basically means that uh, you have to develop and test individual component blocks of a model in, in isolation as well as in combination, right? So that's why it's a hierarchy. So in isolation means when you develop a parameterization, you want to do your whatever is possible to test it against any kind of observational data or LES model or whatever is available uh, to see that that parameterization, you know, works well in isolation. The next step is to plop that into a, a suite and then look at a more, you know, how, how it performs in a case study or something like that. And you can even start with a single column model, so a very simplified model and see how the suite performs there. So I, I think there is room for everything, like uh, testing and developing the individual parameterizations and the suite as a whole. Oh, I see, I see. Thank you, Lydia. OK, uh, there is a more, one more question from Iveta. Do you want to speak, ask you a question? 
Oh, yes, thank you for the representation. I would like to know a little bit more about uh, the two meters temperature and 10 meter winds uh, forecast. Uh, for that part, I think uh, there's a uh, lot of direct, uh, uh, most times a lot of direct forecast variable. For example, two meter temperature sometimes uh, uh, diagnosed variables. So, uh, Uh, I'm not sure I answer your question. Um, uh, so uh, it will come, the, the two meters temperature, for example, will come from the, uh, from which scheme specifically would be a combination or? Uh, it's diagnostic, uh, most time it relates to the surface scheme, PBL and the radiation, yeah. Uh, for comparison, most of the time we compare the model direct output so that at the model level, so it's more easy to compare. Because when you model forecast at the grid level, same value, but if you use different diagnostic uh, method, T2 can be a slightly different. So most of the time when you do the verification, you need to uh, double check with the grid level model direct output. Oh, I see. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, we also uh, we do have these questions uh, post on our Slack channel on the presentation, and and uh, we can certainly follow up all these questions. And we are already past our time. Uh, I think we can have a last call for the questions for Ling Ling's talk. Okay, uh, if not, hard, actually, uh, thanks, uh, thanks for uh, experts from DTC and uh, EMC. And our now, uh, our lunch is scheduled uh, from now to the 1 p.m. US Mountain Time. So let's rest, uh, restart and uh, come back at 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon everyone, and uh, let's start, uh, continue our second day UFS middle range app training. And uh, this afternoon we will have three talks from GFDL experts on FV3 in their lab. Uh, the, the first talk is from Lucas Harris, and uh, Lucas, please uh, start. Oh, hello. Okay, so I can share my screen now. Okay, can everybody see that? Yeah, we can see it. Okay, great. All right, thank you. So uh, thanks for everybody for coming out today. Uh, uh, I want to uh, lead the uh, discussion by myself and my uh, colleagues on the uh, GFDL finite volume cube zero dynamical core, uh, also known as FE3. And I want to discuss both uh, its uh, structure and design and how it's used. So I want to introduce, uh, introduce the three talks. So first of all is a, a talk by uh, myself and my colleague, Shi Chen, 
Uh, she cannot be here today because his wife gave birth to a baby just this Tuesday. Uh, but our talk is going to talk about the design and algorithm of uh, the FV3 dynamical core, as well as interleave within it a number of different essential nameless items. Following that is going to be a, a recorded presentation from uh, my colleague, Lin Zhang Zhou, who'll also be on the line to take questions about physics dynamics coupling in FV3 and to introduce the uh, integrated physics within FV3 as well. And then finally, my colleague Jan Hui Chen is going to discuss the worldwide uh, FE3 community and the whole world of uh, applications of the uh, FE3 dynamical core and some of its predecessors as well. So FE3 is a GFDL finite volume cube sphere dynamical core. And it got its start in the early 90s when uh, SJ Lim was developing the uh, advection scheme for a chemistry transport module at uh, NASA Goddard. Uh, this is a uh, such a such a success though, that it was later developed into a uh, full shallow water dynamical solver and then a fully three-dimensional hydrostatic dynamical core, the famed uh, FV core. And then from there it was extended into a uh, doubly periodic dome into a cube sphere grid, uh, non-hydrostatic dynamics, variable resolution domains, to the present day very uh, feature rich and adaptable uh, FV3 dynamical core using the UFS and many other modeling systems worldwide. Uh, but all, the whole time the same set of principles called the uh, FV3 way has always been adhered to. A uh, focus on uh, physical consistency in the numerics, fully finite volume numerics to the extent that is possible, well, always keeping an eye towards component coupling, especially to physics and the ocean. And also making sure that the algorithm is as computationally efficient as possible without compromising the scientific integrity of that algorithm. So uh, a brief uh, usage guide, and I apologize if I slip up a little bit on this uh, account myself during this talk. Uh, but one thing we do insist upon is that FE3 is a dynamical core and not a model. And so there's a couple of different ways you can refer to FV3. You, so correct ways to say that FV3 is a dynamical core of the GFDL modeling suite and other UFS configurations. You can say that FV3 uses the Lagrangian vertical coordinate and the Putman and Lin 2007 advection scheme. It would not be correct to say that the convection scheme and land surface in FV3 have been updated. It'd be true that you've updated it in uh, UFS ATM, FV3 Atmos, AM4, GEOS, or whichever, but not within FV3. And then uh, if you can make any sense of this, well, then my hat's off to you. So I could uh, discuss at length about the about the, about what finite volume numerics actually means. And people have written very thick books on this. So I don't, unfortunately don't have time to get into all that. I will discuss what finite volume means in the context of FE3. Um, so in FE3, all variables are 3D cell or face means, which are the uh, finite volumes themselves, instead of being grid point values as in traditional dynamical cores. And in FE3, we do not solve the differential Eulerian equa Euler, Euler equations that govern fluid motions, but instead they're uh, cell integrated forms that we derive using the uh, integral theorems of vector calculus. So uh, we are actually going to uh, finite volume integrated forms instead of uh, pointwise differential forms. And this has a number of different consequences for design of FE3 or any other uh, finite volume dynamical core. Everything in FE3 is a flux, including the uh, momentum equation itself. And the fact that everything is a flux means that mass conservation is ensured down to rounding error, that the mass that comes out of one grid cell goes into the next grid cell. Our particular choice of uh, horizontal discretization on the CD grid means that vorticity is computed exactly and is invected as a scalar, or, or, which uh, will have important, uh, important consequences that I'll discuss later. And it also means that we get an accurate uh, computation of divergence as well. We get the best of both worlds from, uh, from the discretization in FE3. One thing that uh, makes uh, dynamical core people very happy is the idea of mimetic properties, that the discretization themselves uh, bakes in some of these physical properties. And one of the big ones is uh, Newton's third law that I will discuss in the context of the pressure gradient force. FV3 the, the, uses the fully compressible Euler equations. Uh, so especially in the horizontal, the calculation is local, which allows for great scalability to many numbers of cores. And something that I'll come back to repeatedly is uh, this uh, rather innovative and powerful feature within FV3, the flow following Lagrangian vertical coordinate. And this is a lot of scientific and computational advantages. Uh, just briefly, it ensures uh, that fine scale vertical street structures are very well preserved that we can represent very intense up and down drafts without violating, uh, without creating instabilities, uh, all while uh, greatly reducing the computational cost of the 3D solver. 
And then finally, in terms of uh, time stepping, FE3, consistent with the uh, finite volume discretization, is a fully forward in time solver uh, with uh, a backwards in time a pressure gradient force and, and uh, implicit vertical acoustic terms. And uh, this will be important. Uh, this will be important for another features. One of the big things is that it preserves some of the important mathematical and physical properties of the fluid flow, and also that it allow by doing that allows us to avoid the production production of computational modes while ensuring that our solver is relatively sim simply while simplifying our our solver compared to some more complicated time stepping methods. So this is the uh, outline of the FV3 dynamical core and any model that it is embedded in. I don't intend to go over this entire uh, flow chart right here, but I do just want to mention that there are three different levels of time stepping within FV3. Uh, the coarsest one, the slowest time step, is the DT Atmos, which is also the physics time step. This is the frequency at which the leading uh, FV dynamics routine is called. Within that, there's a loop over the number of times we do the vertical remapping and uh, tracer transport within FV3. Uh, the number of times this is done per DT Atmos time split is called K split. So the, the quotient of DT Atmos and K split is your tracer, tracer and vertical remapping time step, as well as the frequency at which we run the inline microphysics. The innermost, the fastest time step, is this acoustic and gravity wave process loop in the interior. And the number of times that is called per K split time step is uh, given by the value n split. And uh, this is by uh, dividing uh, k split and n split into dt atmos, you get the uh, time step for the gravity and sound wave processes, which are both invected on the same forward time step. So is everybody seeing the slides advancing OK? OK, great. So uh, these are the uh, nameless options that are available to uh, available within FE3. So DT Atmos is, the, as I mentioned, the physics time step. This should be selected based on the design of the physics. And a lot of physics packages are designed based on uh, are, are are designed with a certain time scale in mind. So like a climate modeling uh, like AM4 or CAM might use a very long time step, say 1800 seconds, an hour, three even three hours perhaps. For very coarse resolution. Uh, for the GFS physics, that's designed with a time step between 150 and 225 seconds. And uh, splitting out the microphysics onto, uh, into the dynamical core allows you to run with a longer time step for that. The other thing that's computed based on uh, scientific considerations is the acoustic time step. Uh, uh, that is governed by the horizontal current number, uh, number the uh, gra combination of gravity of sound wave plus advective uh, maximum wave speeds. It's, uh, so together, you should choose K split and N split then to meet that at value of uh, to meet that acoustic time step. Now you can choose more K splits and fewer N splits to get the same acoustic time step, and usually that will reduce the uh, remapping time step. That'll usually improve your stability, but may also slow down your model uh, as well because remapping is an expensive uh, process. I would recommend an N split value between five and ten. Uh, for best best results, and then choose your case split to match the difference between that and the, your physics time step. I do also want to mention we have a, a runtime switch for the hydrostatic solver. Uh, by setting this to true, it turns on the hydrostatic dynamics. That's about fifty percent faster, but you lose some of the uh, you you lose some you lo do lose the non hydrostatic benefits. Uh, there is some uh, there is some controversy in the community about just how just when. Uh, non-hydrostatic dynamics becomes important. We actually see cha uh, non-trivial changes even at as low as 50 kilometer resolution. At the same time, we see evidence that hydrostatic dynamics may still give you a good result even at one kilometer resolution. So now I want to discuss the cube sphere grid. That's where the three in FV3 comes from. The three is originally a sub, uh, superscript, so this is FV cubed. Uh, the particular cube sphere grid we use is the mnemonic cube sphere grid in which the coordinates are uh, great, given by great circles. And this has a couple of advantages. The big one is that this is the most uniform uh, cube sphere grid. As a result, uh, the, there's less distortion in the flow and your time step has a least restriction. Uh, there are two trade-offs of that. One is that the uh, the mnemonic, mnemonic coordinates are non-orthogonal, so you need to specially design the numerics to handle that. And the way that we do that, we separate out the different covariant and contravariant components of the winds so we can compute the momentum equation and the advective fluxes. Uh, we also have to do special handling at the edges and the corners of the cube sphere due to the kink in the coordinate. That's another, another issue. Uh, the, win uh, the fact that we do have... 
uh, that we do have these staggered winds on this non-orthogonal coordinate. Uh, these are uh, internally to the dynamical core, the winds are defined on those local coordinates. However, this is transparent to any user. We always rotate the winds into the Earth relative zonal meridional coordinates and to the uh, A grid whenever we write out anything from the dynamical core, whether for the physics or to the uh, diagnostics, which I understand makes things a lot easier since, uh, since a lot of times models require you to convert winds into uh, Earth relative coordinates yourself. In the uh, cube sphere grid, these are essential nameless options. Uh, NPX and NPY, these are a little bit uh, tricky. They're actually the number of grid corners in each direction on one face of the cube sphere. So the actual number of grid cells is one less than each of these. On the cube sphere domain, uh, both NPX and NPY need to be the same. However, on the regional domains, nested regional doubly periodic, that's not a requirement. Uh, N tiles is the number of uh, faces of the domain. In this case, since a cube has six faces, there are six tiles. Uh, also, layout, this is a two element array that contains the number of domain decompositions for each direction on each tile. So the, uh, you can choose these values to be whatever you want as long as the uh, don't de decomposed domain size is at least four cells by four cells. But I do recommend that you choose uh, values of the layout that divide evenly into NPX minus one and NPY minus one for best load balancing. You have the same number of grid cells assigned to each uh, processor. And uh, also the total number of cores is the product of, lay of the two layout elements times the six bases on the cube sphere. So I've been mentioning Lagrangian dynamics. Uh, if you remember from dynamics, uh, the Euler equations that govern fluid flow can be written in one of two ways. You can either write them in a, a fixed uh, reference frame, the Eulerian, Eulerian form, or you can write them in a flow following form, the Lagrangian form. What we, do in, what we can also do, and what we do in FE3, is that we use a hybrid of these two, that we remain Eulerian in the horizontal and Lagrangian in the vertical. So this is our vertically Lagrangian coordinate here. And what this does is that this actually has, this is actually something that's very tricky to implement, but it has far reaching consequences for design and the uh, use of our, our dynamical core. And the big thing is that it constrains the flow to be along these quasi horizontal surfaces that deform up and down during the course of the integration. No mass passes between these, uh, Lagr these Lagrangian surfaces, they're fully flow following. And one of the consequences of that is that as the, as the layers deform up and down, that is representing a vertical motion and advection of each grid cell. You are representing your vertical advection for free without needing to explicitly calculate it, which greatly reduces the cost of the algorithm. And now doing that does require that we have two new prognostic variables in the non-hydrostatic solver. We need our layer mass thickness delta P and geometric thickness delta Z. So we have two additional prognostic variables, but this, but even with that little bit of overhead, that still means that we greatly reduce the uh, expense of this of this dynamical core. So here's a list of prognostic variables. There are six prognostic variables plus however many uh, passive tracers you have. Have, have. you can design, define this to be any number from zero up to the hundreds of uh, tracers that are used in bin microphysical or in uh, chemical models. Uh, the six prognostic variables are uh, delta P. This is the uh, hydrostatic pressure depth of each layer, which is prognostic to the total, or excuse me, per, uh, prop proportional to the total air mass, including vapor and condensates within each grid cell. Uh, another, uh, this is advected as a, as a conserved scalar. Uh, so is virtual potential temperature, the product of, uh, of yeah, which is the product of uh, a sum, including the, 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 the water vapor mixing ratio and the potential temperature, both are conserved quantities. So the product is a conserved quantity. Uh, we, I mentioned the horizontal degrid winds defined in the local coordinates. These are staggered, they're or cell tangential values defined on cell faces. You have your two vertical, uh, you have your two non-hydrostatic variables, the vertical velocity and the geometric layer depth as well. So these are all the prognostic variables, but FE3 also defines a lot of diagnostic quantities that are computed on the fly to be able to compute the algorithm. Things like cell mean pressure, density, divergence, specific heat, and so on, which are things you might run into if you dig into the dynamical core. Oh, one other thing that I do want to mention is that uh, similar to many uh, computational fluid dynamics solvers, uh, but not very common in atmospheric science, is that FV3 defines all variables as layer mean values. We do not do any vertical staggering in FV3. 
So one thing that dynamical core people like to gush about and bores everybody else to death is uh, advection schemes. So I only have one or two slides on this. Um, but this is actually quite important because virtually everything within FE3 is uh, represented as, the as some form of advection. So the advection scheme within FE3 is the uh, Lin and Rude scheme named for uh, S.J. Lin and our own esteemed uh, Ricky Rude. And uh, this is a uh, this is a uh, reverse engineered, fully two dimensional scheme that's forward in time, fully forward in time, and constructed from individual one dimensional piecewise parabolic method operators, There's, or any other operators you might want. This is a very flexible scheme, and this has a whole host of uh, positive fe of a of a good features. One is that, of course, it's mass conservative, like a good advection scheme, but also that it uh, preserves correlation between tracers if you use certain limiters. Uh, the form cancels the leading order splitting error, so it's more accurate and has less deformational error. And that that fact also allows us to use separate current number restrictions in X and Y, so you don't have a uh, restriction in diagonal stricter restriction in diagonal flows. And the fact that we're using an upwinding type scheme, uh, piecewise, the piecewise parabolic method operators are both upwinding in space and time combined together. And the fact that we're doing this preserves two important properties. One is the mathematical property of hyperbolicity. It preserves the wave-like character of the Euler equations. And it also preserves causality, which is maybe the one most important principle in all of physics. So there's a distinct chain of causality between events. And these two, and both of these two things right here will turn out will, will uh, be the things that greatly reduce the amount of computational modes in uh, an FE3-based model. Uh, now, of course, invection schemes are used to invect passive tracers. Uh, and the way that we do that is that when we run our end splits, our acoustic gravity wave time steps, we save up the mass fluxes over those time steps. We add them together. And then that combined mass flux is then used to invect the tracers all in one shot. So that's called a free stream preserving subcycled tracer advection. This allows to, and this is useful because tracers can take a much longer time step than can gravity wave and sound wave modes. Uh, but we go beyond just tracers. All quasi horizontal processes, with the exception of the pressure gradient force in FE3, can be represented as some form of advection. And uh, one, one more advantage I mentioned the adaptability of uh, the finite volume of the linen rood scheme. And uh, one, one example of that is given here. We can replace the monotonic convection for tracers with this strictly positive definite scheme. And this has a big impact that it greatly improves hurricane structure. This is described in a recent article and in a new other article we recently submitted. Uh, some of the options for advection schemes, I want to mention three he three things here. One is that you'll see different uh, values of HRD for different uh, variables. I strongly recommend using the same advection option for MT, VT, and TM because, as, well, as I'll mention later, advecting different scalars with the, the same advection scheme means that you also advect their products together as a scalar also. So that's a very powerful property that you want to preserve. Uh, meanwhile, HRDTR, the tracer advection scheme, you have to use a monotonic or positive definite scheme to avoid negatives from arising. This is particularly important when you start doing uh, chemistry because a lot of chemical equation solvers are very stiff, and if you give them a negative value, they'll blow up. Uh, and then there's a couple of different sets of options for the advection schemes. Traditionally, we've used these monotonic constraints, uh, which are very nice. They never produce new extrema, but they are, most, they are pretty diffusive as well. So more recently, we switched towards using what are called unlimited schemes that have no uh, that are non-monotonic, and we have two in particular. We have this virtually inviscid unlimited scheme HRD five, and uh, this allows this this runs with virtually no implicit dissipation. It is the fastest, most computationally efficient, and least effusive, and it does still run, producing beautifully little noise, but it does tend to make storms develop too quickly. So as a result, we also have a slightly more diffusive, minimally diffusive uh, HRD6. And this uh, is a little bit more diffusive, but it does give the best skill and tends to give the best storm structure, even if it does cause weaker tropical cyclones. Oh, I also want to mention the uh, positive definite uh, scheme that is just now being integrated within the rest of the UFS, the minus five scheme. So... Now into one of the most power, one of the most powerful emphasis within uh, FE3, and uh, one thing that's immediately obvious to anybody who studies or even looks at fluids or any different times, particularly uh, geophysical fluids, is that fluids are strongly vorticial at all scales, ranging from these very small uh, fluid flows within your bathtub to uh, uh, to uh, the great red spot on Jupiter, bigger than the Earth itself, and 
especially in geophysical flows, fluid uh, vorticial motions, vorticial fluid flows are long lived. They're the high impact flows, and they're also important for maintaining the general circulation of the atmosphere and ocean. So the discretization in FD3, we make a number of different uh, choices that emphasize this. Uh, we use the vector invariant equations, this dual CD grid discretization, and we consistently advect uh, vorticity and other quantities that we uh, would like to, so that the derived quantities involving vorticity are consistently advected. And uh, something I do want to point is that uh, this, is, this isn't necessarily just true of FE3. A lot of the old uh, spectral solvers made a very good emphasis on vorticity. But one thing that we have found is that solvers that do not emphasize vorticity do, see ver uh, uh, do, do not see as well a preservation of vorticity as FE3 does. Oh, one thing I do want to mention is that some of the early work on the uh, atmosphere of Jupiter was actually done at, uh, at GFDL. So the momentum equation that we use, or more properly the, uh, uh, the velocity equation, is the nonlinear flux form vector invariant equations, uh, which gets its name from the, this kind of geometrical form that it has, uh, which involves these two scalars, the absolute vorticity and the kinetic energy. Uh, the fact that we have scalars there means that they're represented the same in all coordinate systems, especially when you have a variable non-orthogonal coordinate like, uh, like the mnemonic cube sphere does. And this uh, this not only looks looks nice if it's a little bit mysterious, but one of the thing one of the terms here is this term here on the first term on the right that is the absolute vorticity flux. And this is where our one of the advantages using the D grid and this form comes in is that we can then use Stokes' theorem to exactly compute both vorticity and the advection of vorticity itself. And, which reduces down to the uh, to this advective form that represents the barotropic vorticity equation. So we can do all this with no averaging, and we're retaining these nice properties about vorticity immediately. But since we're advecting vorticity as a scalar, the cell integrated vorticity, the, we're using what we're using our finite volume advection scheme to advect it. It, but we're using that same advection scheme to advect the other variables. So when we advect the vorticity in another variable in the same way, it's like you're advecting the product of those two also as a scalar. So this is a lot of immediate consequences. One is that if you're advecting mass or height as a uh, as also the same way, this improves geostrophic balance and advects shallow water potential vorticity as a scalar. And you can go even beyond that uh, to very small scales. If you're advecting the vertical velocity as a scalar, the same way as vorticity, that improves nonlinear balance. And the product of those two, the updraft helicity, very important quantity for uh, severe storms forecasting, is also advected as a scalar. And we find beautiful representations of, uh, of uh, updraft helicity in our FE3-based models. So I've mentioned the CD grid solver. Uh, we, uh, to be in, consistent with our preservation of vorticity, we discretize the winds, the purely horizontal winds. There's no, no along surface and vertical component of the horizontal winds on the D grid. Uh, but I mentioned everything is a flux. The solver requires face normal as well as time mean fluxes to be consistent with the finite volume discretization. So for, to be able to get the time mean fluxes as well as the face normal winds, we take a page from a lot of computational fluid dynamics methods, which use something called a Riemann solver, in which they dispense with all this grid staggering business and just use a cell-centered A grid for everything. But then they use, they basically build in the entire dynamics into their interpolation to get a very accurate representation of the fluxes. And we do something similar here. We use the CD grid it, it solver, in which we interp we first interpolate the D grid winds to the C grid to get an inaccurate first guess of the C grid advective winds. And then we advect that forward using a half time step using the same solver, just at lower order, to be able to get a more accurate and a representation of a cell time mean in flux. So we get this uh, two, so we have this uh, time mean winds. This is, these are upwind fluxes again, you're preserving causality. And this together with this two grid discretization help us avoid computational modes. This is what allows us to run FE3 with a very minimal amount of uh, diffusion is that it simply it produces very few computational modes. Now, one thing I do want to point out is that the upstream flux is that I mentioned everything is a flux. The kinetic energy can also be written as a certain flux as well that allows us to advect the, to compute that consistently with the other terms in the momentum equation. 
And this is important for preventing what's called the Hollingsworth Kahlberg instability. Uh, Hollingsworth was one of the early leaders of the uh, European Center. And this is actually something that uh, I've actually seen other people develop solvers and not actually pay enough attention to, which winds up being to their de detriment. So I've mentioned the flux terms within the horizontal momentum equation. The last term is the uh, pressure gradient force, which is a computed backwards in time to be able to maintain stability. And now traditionally, most models use a, a, use a center difference approach to be able to compute the pressure gradient force. This produces a lot of noise because you're taking the small difference of two large numbers when you're doing that. And instead, in FV3, we take a fully finite volume approach to doing this, is that we integrate the uh, pressure gradient force form. We compute, use Newton's second and third laws and use Green's theorem to come up with a cell integrated form that has a couple of nice advantages. One is that it's purely horizontal, first of all, that there's no along coordinate projection, so it's very accurate. Don't have any spurious vertical velocities arising from it. Uh, the pressure gradient force is computed so that the force from one grid cell on another, the action, is equal to the reaction force back on that original grid cell, that we've mimetically recovered Newton's third law by doing this, and also that we conserve momentum. And furthermore, this construction is also uh, curl-free in the absence of uh, density gradients. So you can see that the amount of errors created in, in with this finite volume pressure gradient force is much less than in a traditional uh, noisy type of type, in a traditional noisy pressure gradient force evaluation. And you can see that also in a more recent uh, evaluation of this as well. Um, one thing I do want to point out, I haven't mentioned the non-hydrostatic dynamics much yet, is that you can compute the non-hydrostatic and hydrostatic components of the pressure gradient force separately. And this is useful because the uh, hydrostatic component of the pressure varies much more slowly than the non-hydrostatic component. So we can compute the pressure gradient force with the log of the hydrostatic pressure which gives us much more accuracy, and then compute with the hydrostatic, uh, non-hydrostatic pressure, uh, just with the full values. Uh, we, I want to mention the uh, vertical coordinate within FV3. So I'm going to first mention the uh, reference coordinate that we will uh, remap back onto uh, periodically to be able to give the, the output from FV3 back to the physics. We use a, a hybrid pressure coordinate in FV3 with the top level at the top k equals 1 at the top. Uh, this has a flexible lid, a constant pressure top. And one thing that we've done is we've defined a large number of vertical level setups that are predefined within the dynamical core with differing numbers of levels, different level placements to emphasize different features, and uh, different uh, pressure tops. So here's three examples that we use in our uh, shield, our GFS-like model. And one caution I do want to point out about these vertical level designs is that they are, are carefully built to avoid instability and noises at places where you might get an inst uh, discontinuity in the levels. And I say this, I really want to caution everybody that if you do want to create your own new sets of vertical levels to use extreme caution to make sure that they are designed carefully and correctly, and in particular be very, very cautious about automatic generation of the number of, of your vertical level setups because sometimes uh, discontinuities can sneak in unexpectedly. So there's a very large number of selections of vertical levels already uh, already defined in FE eta. Uh, I, I would recommend taking a look at, the, at that. And finally, we get to the uh, description of the Lagrangian vertical coordinate. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we are Lagrangian in the vertical in FE3. Uh, so the layers are allowed to deform with no mass being exchanged between the different levels. And this allows us to implicitly represent vertical motion without needing to uh, explicitly compute vertical advection of any quantity. And, and simply the fact that we have these two additional variables by, that, we, that are prognostic variables is enough to be able to handle all that. I mentioned the, uh, the computational aspect of this, that this greatly reduces the amount of computation you need to do, uh, but also has scientific values, uh, some scientific values. Uh, the big one is that there is no current number restriction in, uh, in FV3 in the vertical, that you can take a very long vertical remapping time step as a result. We routinely see uh, vertical current numbers upwards of 10 or 20 in some of our simulations. And yeah, and also this uh, avoids, this also av really reduces the amount of vertical diffusion that you have. During the uh, deformation of the layers, there is no diffusion between the layers at all. Now, the stability constraint in the Lagrangian vertical coordinate is this weaker Lifshitz cri uh, stability criterion, which is the, the uh, 
which is a restriction that each layer cannot become infinitely thin. You cannot have so much divergence that a uh, layer empties out, essentially. So periodically, to, uh, to avoid this from being violated, we remap back to our reference Eulerian coordinate. And we want to do, and uh, we only do this periodically. We don't do this every time step, because every time you do that, it does introduce artificial diffusion, a little bit of diffusion. But the amount of diffusion being added in is greatly reduced by our high order remapping. And we also do this a conservative remapping. It's complicated, but it's very, it's designed to be as efficient as possible. And people avoid as much, uh, uh, it's uh, greatly minimizes the amount of diffusion in the vertical compared to an Eulerian advection scheme. So this is the only way that any cross-layered diffusion is introduced within FV3. So there's a variety of different remapping schemes. Um, I do want to mention that it's best, again, to keep all the uh, schemes, the, all, to use for all the variables the same remapping scheme to, again, preserve consistency and correlations between the variables. One thing I do want to mention is that it's recommended to remap uh, temperature instead of potential temperature by specifying K or DTM to be less than zero. And what this means is that this is done because the vertical gradient of potential temperature is very large in the stratosphere and upper atmosphere, uh, whereas for temperature, it's relatively small. So the error is less when you remap temperature. Uh, there's a number of different remapping schemes. I recommend using the cubic splines when possible. And also in a weather time scale applications, we find that the particular form of the cubic spline, this fourth order, very accurate cubic spline, doesn't matter a whole lot. But the particular form may be important in climate applications where you want to maintain vertical structures over very long integration times. OK, now finally getting back to the, reason, to the point of the uh, non-hydrostatic solver. So we, uh, the uh, new variables, w and delta z, are advected for their forward terms the same way as all the other variables. So we remain consistent with the other uh, advective variables. But we do need to evaluate the vertical pressure gradient and the uh, other sound wave terms in the vertical. So we, do, we compute that by introducing a semi-implicit solver be able to update a number of different variables that for to represent these non-hydrostatic processes, and that's really all you need. The non-hydrostatic dynamics is essentially just an just an extension of the classic finite volume hydrostatic algorithm. Um, so basically, you get the same great taste, but your but this, but the great some great non-hydrostatic dynamics to go with it. And this allows us to solve the full fully compressible non-hydrostatic Euler equations. Uh, so now one of the most misunderstood things about numerical modeling regards uh, numerical diffusion. And it turns out that one of the dirty secrets about a lot of models is that, and maybe people don't even recognize this, is that all useful numerical models need to have grid scale motions removed by numerical diffusion, and whether they know it or not. And this is not because of some flaw in our numerical models. This is a physical process of en kinetic energy cascading to grid scales, a Kolmogorov tur turbulent cascade. And in, the re in a real fluid, it motions the cascade to smaller and smaller scales until they get down to the dissipative scales at a couple of centimeters where vis viscous effects are represented. Well, that's not done in any weather model that I know about. So you need to have some way of removing grid scale motions, either through a turbulence scheme or a uh, numeric artificial diffusion scheme. And grid scale noise come in from a lot of other, other reasons. Uh, Numerical models aren't perfect, so physics can do weird things. Initial and boundary conditions can do weird things, and from just a whole lot of other things. So simply due to these mistakes, you need to be able to remove your grid scale motions. Uh, but that's not all. Diffusion is actually a way that a, a powerful tool to be able to improve simulations. And here's some examples here. Uh, in particular, one thing a lot of uh, mechanical engineers have found is that numeric, that implicit diffusion can actually give you a better large eddy scheme than a progno than a explicit large eddy uh, turbulent representation. So in FE3, we, the FE3 is so well de designed I mean, with attention to physical consistency and principles that there's very few computational modes that get produced. So we can be, um, we can be very minimally dis diffusive. We can use very weakly diffusive uh, advection schemes and so on. But well, configuring your diffusion the right way can improve your results quite nicely. Uh, so FE3 has a very accurate uh, handling of di of divergent modes in particular. There is no direct implicit diffusion to divergent modes, and they cascade to the grid scale completely unimpeded. So to be able to represent the physical dissipation of these divergent modes, that we need to apply a scale-selective divergence stamping. Okay. 
Now, also, uh, we need to damp the rotational modes as they cascade to grid scale as well. They can be damped implicitly by monotonic advection, which is traditionally done in a lot of climate models that use FE3. But you can also use an explicit vorticity damping that for consistency also damps the other variables that are advected consistently with vorticity. One thing I do want to point out is that there is no explicit damping for tracers. The other thing I also want to point is that all, uh, all diffusion is along Lagrangian surfaces. There is no explicit vertical uh, diffusion within FE3, with one exception that I'll mention in a couple of slides. Uh, re representing the very wide range of applications that FE3 is used for, the numerical damping within FE3 is very highly configurable. Uh, we have a couple of different orders of uh, divergence damping. You can use fourth, sixth, or eighth order, increasingly highly scale selective damping. Uh, for the divergence. We also have fourth and sixth order damping available for vorticity. Uh, the divergence damping, since there's no other damping, there's no implicit damping to divergence, uh, you, you, you can use a divergence damping coefficient. Values between 0.1 and 0.15 are recommended, although smaller values can be tried as well. Uh, since there is a little bit of implicit diffusion on the uh, vorticity, on the vorti vortical modes, that there is, you should use a smaller coefficient for the vorticity damping if you use that. We also have the, the ability to uh, restore the damped kinetic energy as heat to be able to conserve the lost kinetic energy. Uh, you can restore a particular fraction of this, or, and you can limit it to a certain magnitude as well. A brief digression on uh, uh, handling of the upper boundary condition within FE3. We have a, a flexible lid, a constant pressure top, that is, does a good job at absorbing vertically propagating gravity waves. Uh, this is distinct from the uh, rigid lids in a lot of z-coordinate models. So as a result, we only have two sponge layers within FE3. I know there, there's a variance of FE3 that you do use more uh, sponge layers. Uh, in these two sponge layers, we apply a strong second-order uh, diffusion within those two layers. Here's, that's specified by these two coefficients. We also have the option to use uh, Rayleigh damping in the stratosphere, which is specified with a certain time scale at the top, and then uh, which becomes longer and longer until you get down to pressure RF cutoff. Uh, we also have this uh, this uh, two delta Z energy conserving energy momentum and mass conserving filter that's also available applied that is applied whenever the Richardson number gets too small. Uh, it's referred to using this N sponge quantity. That's a bit of a misleading name, unfortunately. We plan on changing that. Uh, that's the number of layers at the top, especially in the stratosphere that you apply this to. That you can also apply with a certain time scale. A little bit about options that are useful for uh, debugging and digging into the dynamical core, or that just at least give you something to watch if you if you want while the model is running. Uh, print frequency, that's the frequency at which a number of different diagnostics outputs, uh, maximum, minimum, average values are printed out. If you want to check to see when the salt, when the values are getting out of a certain good range, you can turn on this range warn option. That'll print it, let you know whenever you get a bad value of some variable. Uh, if you want to print out even more debugging data, you can turn on FE debug. There's also this neat no die core option to turn off the dynamics. So you can run just in a column physics mode. There's a lot of options for initializing FV3 um, that are all enabled by using external IC. You can initialize from uh, regridded ICs uh, from change res that's done through the NGGPS IC that assumes that you're already on the horizontal grid that you want. Uh, you can also uh, initialize from various latitude longitude analyses like the European Center's uh, initial conditions. Uh, that does this does do the horizontal interpolation. I should point out both um, both these cases as well as for read increment that reads in uh, data assimilation increments. They do the vertical remapping onto your native model levels, and also uh, ensure that the var input variables are converted to something that's consistent with the dynamics in FE3. We I also want to mention this uh, forward backwards uh, solver that's useful for initializing from uh, hydrostatic initial conditions to be able to spin, spin up the non-hydrostatic state. Uh, I'll tell you, you don't need it if you're initializing from GFS version 15 or 16. A little bit about uh, restarts. There's a number of different options here. So uh, you, can uh, you can read in vertical level coefficients from a restart file instead of hard-coded from FE ADA. Uh, you can also specify to write out interpolated A grid wins to the restart files. This is useful for uh, data assimilation cycling. But also, it's also useful for uh, debugging. I find that looking at the restart files is really useful for figuring out pathologies within the model. Uh, you can also restart at a different number of vertical levels by using the NPZ restart functionality. Uh, and then uh, FE3 will automatically remap to the correct number of levels. And you can also reset the uh, non-hydrostatic state when you start up as well. 
And finally, a brief word about restarting, which turns out to be very easy in any FE3-based model. All you need to do is just move the restart files from your restart directory into the input directory. And when you uh, start up your FE3-based model, it will automatically read in both, the, both in FE3 and in the physics. It will automatically read in all those restart files and then start the model off happily as if nothing had happened. Uh, you do need to set a couple of options to make sure that your solutions avoid getting reset when you do uh, restart. And uh, this is my last slide. I do want to mention that we do have a great quantity of reference material available on the FE3 website. We have this page of uh, documentation and references, including peer-reviewed articles, as well as uh, some of our technical memos that we are writing now. Uh, we have published one tech memo already, and we plan to uh, put forth even more that describe new features within FE3, as well as uh, describing more of the internals of the dynamical core. OK, so uh, that is it. I am uh, out of time. So uh, now I will hand it off to uh, hand it off to Matt so we can play a Lin Zhang's recording. So thank you very much. OK, thank you, uh, Lucas. Uh, do we want actually uh, for, to have a couple minutes to have questions from our audience? If we have actually. <laughs> Questions from our audience for Lucas. Yeah, I think we we we, we can speak up. I'll ask now, <laughs> or we can wait until the end of this talk, or even during the practical session. Okay, I have a question. This is Sui. Yes, go ahead, Sui. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Lucas, you mentioned that the numerical diffusion can help improve the model's uh, performance to some extent. Um, could you please explain more? Like, uh, is that because like the numerical uh, diffusion is inevitable, but because uh, our physics or because the turbulence can be represented so that can like um, balance our error or what does that mean? Thank you. Okay, so there's it, a lot of it depends on the particular application that you have in mind. So one of the canonical examples is uh, in HiRAM, which is our uh, high, uh, relatively high resolution climate model for simulating hurricanes. And uh, one thing that was found is kind of counterintuitive thing is that by increasing the diffusion, they found that hurricanes actually got more intense at 50 and 25 kilometer resolution. And the reason for that is because uh, in HiRAM, um, we can generate a lot of uh, relatively small-scale convective cells that are supported by the dynamics. But those small-scale convective cells, they like to eat up cape very quickly. And that means that there's cape that's eaten up by small-scale convection that is not then available for uh, tropical cyclones themselves. If you damp out those unwanted, kind of unwanted small-scale convective cells, which may not necessarily be realistic, uh, this allows uh, this allows more energy available to tropical cyclones to be able to grow more more intense. So that's just one example there. It all depends on the particular uh, application that you you want. Um, but there's a number of different a a cases in which simply just running Inviscid may give you a will probably give you a stable a stable integration. But it doesn't necessarily mean it will give you the best result. I see. So this, this numerical diffusion are from the numerical scheme itself, or we manually enter this numerical diffusion? It's uh, a combination of uh, implicit and explicit diffusion. Uh, when I talk about increasing the diffusion, I'm usually referring to the explicit diffusion term. Although there are interesting things that we see when we change the advection scheme to have more and less uh, implicit diffusion. And uh, another example that I can give is uh, that paper by Pressel that I mentioned. That was actually uh, one of Tapio Schneider's uh, scientists who was designing a large eddy simulation model. Uh, and uh, what they found is that they tried a bunch of different large eddy simulation turbulence schemes. The one that they found actually gave the best results was when they used no explicit diffusion, but instead used a monotonicity scheme. And that actually gave them the most consistent, uh, most consistent and simulation of cloud stratocumulus, uh, as well as gave them the most realistic simulation of uh, stratocumulus as well. This is something that's been really hard, even for large eddy models to reproduce. I see. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. OK, thanks. And uh, uh, do we have more questions from audience? 
Okay, great. Okay, so uh, let's move on. And Brad, please, uh, uh, please go ahead. I, yeah, right. thank you. <laughs> Following Lucas' thorough introduction to the FU3 Danipo call, I'm going to talk about the coupling between the FU3 and the physics package. Here, the physics package does not limit to the GFS or UFS physics package. The coupling I'm going to talk about, it is not like the CCPP coupling. It is a general idea of how we couple the physics on the dynamical core side. My talk covers the physics interface on the dynamic side, the definition of mass and total energy, and their difference to the definition in the GFS physics the moist thermodynamic equations, the application of the Jeff Dell microphysics using the consistent thermodynamic equations with the FE3. And finally, I will briefly talk about the integrate physics developed at Jeff Dell for our shield model. Why do we need a physics interface? That is because in the same model grid box, on the dynamic side, it is a finite volume of moist air. Here, moist air consists of dry air, water vapor, liquid water, that is cloud water and rain, and solid water, which is cloud ice, snow, or gravel. However, on the physics side, this grid box contains only dry air and water vapor. And most of the physical parameterizations in the GFS model are done in the dry air grid box. It doesn't mean there is no liquid or solid water in the physics. It just says that liquid and solid water doesn't enroll in the thermodynamic processes. We know that the heat capacity of dry air is about 1004 on constant pressure and about 717 on constant volume. But the heat capacity of water vapor, it is nearly twice of the dry air. Liquid water is about four times of the dry air. Solid water is about two times of the dry air. Without water vapor and liquid solid water, the heating in the grid box is different. The heating is generally larger. That is why we need a physics interface to handle the differences between dynamics and physics carefully. The physics interface is an essential part of the model that connects the dynamics and the physics. From the dynamics to the physics, the subroutine MS physics driver stay in, passes all the variables, do the 32-bit to 64-bit conversion if the dynamic and the physics use different positions. In JFS version 15, both dynamics and physics are using 64-bit precision, so no change is needed. But in the model developed at JFDL, the dynamical core is 32-bit changes needed here. There are different treatments between hydrostatic and non-hydrostatic situation. For example, the calculation of height and pressure. From the physics to the dynamics, the subroutine atmosphere stay update passes all the variables. Do the 64 bit to 32 bit conversion if necessary. Fix negative chaser values by vertical mixing. This process was created because we noticed negative hydromedium output from the convection scheme. Finally, the diagnostic of atmospheric variables are done here, such as the pressure level, temperature, height, wind, water vapor, and so on. In the subroutine MS physics gyro stay in, air temperature T is passed without any change. The A grid Zuno and Meridional wing U and V are passed without change. 
The vertical velocity omega is passed without change too. Please know that these variables are not the prognostic variables in every free, but they have been carefully calculated along with the dynamics processes. However, the pressure's thickness, delta P, is passed up to removing the liquid and solid water. The chaser Q is converted to max mixing ratio regarding to the dry air and water vapor. I will talk about these two processes in detail in the later slides. Edge layer high, ZE is the sum of the high thickness, delta Z, from the surface. Middle layer high ZM is the aromatic mean of the edge layer high ZE. Edge layer pressure PE is the sum of the pressure thickness delta P from model top. Middle layer pressure PM is calculated using the gas law. In the subroutine atmosphere state update, the air temperature tendency for all phases delta T, delta T is used to update temperature. Delta T here is the temperature difference between after and before the whole physics package. In the update of the temperature, the heat capacity conversion, it is applied. I will talk about this in detail in the following slides. Juno and Meridional wind tendencies for all physics delta U, delta T, delta V, delta T are used to update C and D grid wings. The same as the temperature, delta U, delta V are the wind speed different between after and before the whole physics package. Pressure thickness, delta P, is passed after adding liquid and solid water back. Remember that liquid and solid water will remove before passing to the physics. Same as the pressure thickness, chaser Q is converted back to the mix, max mixing ratio regarding to the total air. Because the air is defined as moist air in the dynamics and as dry plus water vapor in the physics, the definition of air mass is of course different. So in the dynamics, the pressure thickness delta P is defined regarding to the total mass of air, MA. MA is the sum of each mass component of the air. Right in the physics, the pressure thickness delta P is defined regarding to the mass of dry air and water vapor only. Meanwhile, in the dynamics, Chaser's max mixing ratio Q is defined regarding to the total mass. So it is M chaser over MA. And in the physics, Chaser's max mixing ratio is defined regarding to the mass of dry air, MD, and water vapor, MV. Because of those differences, in the physics interface, there are mass conversions. Before being passed to the physics, pressure thickness, delta P, is converted to that of dry air and water vapor mass using this formula to remove liquid and solid water. And before being passed to the dynamics, pressure thickness delta P is then converted to that of total mass using this formula. Regarding the chasers, Qs are converted to that of dry air and water vapor mass before passing to the physics using this formula to remove the mass of liquid and solid water. And it converted back to the total mass before passing back to the dynamic using this once. This mass conversions must be carefully done in the physics interface. Otherwise, there will be huge mass non-conservation. Due to the mass difference in the grid balls, the total energy is also different. In the dynamics, the total energy is defined as internal energy, CVT, 
plus the potential energy pi plus the kinetic energy. The internal energy is written as CVT, but not CPT, because the F3 is in the Lagrangian control volume coordinate. If it involves Moist processes, the internal energy CVT is redefined following Emmanuel as CVMT plus latent energy. CVM includes the heat capacities of water vapor, liquid water, and solid water. Latent energy, latent heat coefficients are derived from the Kirchhoff law. However, in the physics, the total energy is defined as internal energy CPT plus potential energy pi and kinetic energy. CPT, not CVT, is used here, which means it considers dry air only because CP is the heat capacity of dry air on constant pressure. This form of total energy is used by physical parameterizations in many models, including the Jepdel climate models. Due to the difference in the forms of total energy, and it is very difficult to revise all physical parameterizations to use the same form while keeping the foundation and performance. A temporal solution was built in the physics interface. This solution is heating from the physics is converted to the proportional heating in the dynamics. That is keeping the total energy but remaining their own heat capacity definitions. We think the long term and best solution is to reconsider the air definition in each physical parameterization design. That inspire us to build our own cloud microphysics, the Jeffdale microphysics. I will talk about this in the later slides. Based on all the definitions mentioned above, the moist thermodynamics is then rewritten. According to the definition of total energy for moist processes, divide the n and n plus one times that internal energy, i.e. as this. All variables is that LV and LI are changed up to one times that. Based on energy conservation, IE at n times that equals to IE at n plus one times that. We can derive a relationship like this in the condition of condensation or evaporation. Similar formula can be derived for freezing or melting, sublimation or deposition. That is for all phase changes. This thermodynamic relationship applies to most processes built in F3 dynamical core, such as the fast saturation adjustment, the inline Jeffdale microphysics used in Jeffdale in the shield model. One of the successful applications following the above definitions and conservation is the Jeffdale microphysics. The Jeffdale microphysics is developed following the definitions of mass and total energy in the F3 dynamical core. That is particularly important because microphysics prioritization involves all chasers or substitutes in the air balls. Heating and cooling are significantly different. Mass and total energy are precisely conserved inside the microphysics scheme. If there isn't done correctly, huge total energy non-conservation will show up and the model will possibly crash. To work together with other physics, mass and total energy are converted before and after the microphysics scheme. This has to be done with when the Jeffdale microphysics stay with other physics in the physics package. In the past few years, the Jeffdale microphysics has been embedded into the dynamical core. Microphysical process tied to the dynamic processes and no conversion is needed. 
this saves the time and keep the precision. When the model's resolution goes higher and higher, the advantage of decoupling between dynamical core and microphases will stand up. The next steps of every free physics coupling is so-called integrated physics. Traditionally, dynamics and physics are separated. They are linked through the physics interface. This is just what I'm talking about in this talk. Moving forward requires breaking the strict separation of dynamics and physics. If you think about it in deep, dynamic processes are actually physics processes. And physics processes involve dynamic processes. So separating dynamics and physics doesn't make much sense, right? Subgrid orography effects are fast processes. Microphysics and pollution source and sink are intermediate processes. Radiation, PBL, and so on are relatively slow processes. This statement may be arguable. The boundaries between different physics may not be that clear. But the point is that using the same time step to perceive different physical parameterizations and do it sequentially may not be may be inappropriate. Partially resolved and fast processes can be integrated directly into F3 for better dynamical core consistency, energy conservation, and efficiency. That is to say, let the dynamical core do all the dynamic related processes. Thank you. Okay, I think that's the end of uh, Lin Zhong's talk. And, but uh, uh, she, he, he's with us now, actually. So uh, let's have some time to, let, let's save some, some time to have the questions. Okay, what this means, we do. Okay, okay uh, any questions from audience? Ling Jing. Okay. See, we don't have questions from Slack, and I didn't see any question from the chat. I have a question about the gravity wave drive. So do you uh, suggest that to uh, use uh, gravity drag in the fast physics? Yes, here yeah, Lin Zhong. Yes, we think so. The fast, uh, the gravity drag we think is a fast process and can be integrated into the dynamical core. Actually, we have successfully um, integrated a uh, gravity jet in the uh, F3 core. So include the mountain uh, gravity wave? Yes, include the mountain mountain block. Okay, thank you. Okay, do we have more questions from audience? Okay, if not, uh, let's move on. And uh, our next talk is also from GFDL, uh, Jiang Huichen, she will give another talk on GFDL FE3 uh, system. So, uh, Jianghui, are you ready? Yeah, I'm here. So can okay, everybody... Please go ahead. Can everybody see a slide or hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, good afternoon, uh, I'm Jianghui Chen. And uh, first I thank Ling Zhong and Lucas Save the Fund. It's part for me to present. I'm talking about uh, the uh, basic global model configurations use AV3 as a dynamical core and what the result we have got. And all the scientific results are uh, from our AV3 team and other GFDL scientists, including NOAA federal employee and the Princeton University and UCAR scientists. 
So I would like to start from the global AV3 community to show who is using AV3 right now. And about AV3 at the GFDO, I will briefly talk about the history of GFDO uh, climate modeling uh, development and how we involved into the unified modeling suite. And we try to achieve seamless weather climate prediction and projection. And especially, we will like to focus on hurricanes, severe weather, MJL, diurnal cycle, those events who, uh, which can affect our daily life. And I also would like to mention a little bit about our current progress of, of developing a global cloud resolving model. So this chart shows the uh, global AV3 community. When uh, Dr. A. C. Lin developed the final volume uh, uh, dynamical core, he uh, in late 1990s, he working with NASA. So even right now, the NASA GEOS and Marriott 2 model is still using AV3. And also the Harvard University, when they created GEOS CAN, they used the AV3 as a dynamical core because the uh, excellent uh, tracer advection scheme. And the NCAR CAN model have two configurations, AV and AV3, outside of the United States. Chinese Academy of Science in China and the Central Weather Bureau in Taiwan also adopt AV3 in their global model. And at GFD, of course, all current uh, global model are using AV3 as a dynamical core. And after NGGPS, when we uh, AV3 got selected by the National Weather Service, GFS model uh, started using AV3, of course, and uh, uh, UFS uh, as uh, people attend this workshop. Okay, about AV3 at the GFDO, uh, this chart shows the recent, recent history of GFDO global model, climate model development. We traditionally follow the IPCC CIMIT project from CIMIT 3, CIMIT 5 to CIMIT 6. We have CM2, CM3, HIREN, and CM4. Uh, between CM2, CM3, and HIREN, there's a configuration called CM2.1. That's the first uh, GFDL global model used the finite volume as the dynamical core on the Lelong grid. In 2006, Tom Dallas' paper, it shows from CM2.0 to CM2.1 because of the excellent uh, uh, simulation of the versatility. Uh, CM2.1 show the southern hemisphere tropical jack at a, a better location. And this further impact on the ocean heat content simulation. So we can see compared to the CM2.0, the big grid code, the global mean ocean temperature error reduced a lot in the CM2.1. And currently at GFDL, we are using the fourth generation unified modeling suite, including four major global models, SHIELD, SPEAR, CM4, ESMM4. SHIELD model um, is mainly developed by our AV3 team. It, it focuses on the weather to subseasonal to seasonal time scale. And SPEAR model developed by the GFDO SD team, uh, SD group, and they focus on the seasonal to decadal prediction and projection. And CM4 is IPCC uh, CM6 model. Uh, it, it, it taking care of decades to centuries climate processes. And the ESM4 is the Earth modeling system. It has the fully interactive atmosphere chemistry. So it can show a lot of, uh, especially ocean bio, biochemistry uh, researches. And all, of course, all the models use AV3 as the dynamical core for their atmosphere model. And I also would like to mention that all those models that use the FMS framework mentioned earlier in other talks, and that FMS framework already as a part of the UFS system. So in the future, when we have uh, more updates or bug fixing, all, all those kind of uh, uh, all those like uh, updates can easily be integrated or for share with the community. So yeah, GFDO will try to uh, achieve seamless prediction projection. And uh, we focus, uh, we try to cover from the daily weather forecast time scale from hourly to climate projection century long. 
and uh, in different time scale, we focus on different uh, events from uh, severe weather, hurricanes to MJO, uh, heat waves to ENSO. And before we use high rain and high flow already achieve a pretty skillful of seasonal to seasonal to time uh, decadal prediction projections. And right now we focus on the uh, uh, shield and the spear model. Shield model is a uh, weather-based uh, development model, and the spear is um, from a traditional climate model. And we this both model trying to um, to cover the entire seamless prediction projection modeling system at GDO. Uh, since the shield model is mainly developed by our AV3 team, so in the following uh, slides, I'm going to uh, uh, say more about this model. Shield model, the full name, is a system for high resolution prediction on Earth to local domain. It focuses on weather to uh, seasonal application. The middle one is our flagship shield. Uh, the resolution is 13 kilometers globally and taking care of all the global weather prediction. And we have a relative lower uh, resolution configuration, C384, about the global 25 kilometer. And we use this for subseasonal to seasonal prediction. And uh, for severe weather prediction, we create a sea shield, which has a nasty three kilometer nested to cover the uh, United uh, continent. And then for uh, we also have a two uh, different T shield. Uh, cover the uh, for Atlantic Basin and the Marian continent focus differently on tropical cyclone and the MJO prediction. We also have a three kilometer regional uh, shield uh, it can use for regional storm prediction and we also use it as a very nice idealized test bed for uh, test all the uh, dy uh, new dy dynamics and the physics. And for X shield is designed for cloud global cloud resolving simulation is three kilometer. We are still it's a prototype uh, configuration. We're still working on it. And uh, here I would like to show you this uh, new web page uh, shield.gfdo.noah.gov/new. It's our uh, uh, semi operational uh, with, uh, weather forecast web page. So on this page you can choose different of our model configuration and uh, show different area for the 10 day or five day forecast and focus on different, uh, uh, starting from different initial time. Uh, so uh, we just welcome people to use it and take a look. If you have any problem, there's a help desk link, you can find it and, and, and send to us. Okay. So about our 13 kilometer flagship uh, shield evo evolution. It's originally started from in 2015 during the NGGPS project. And we combined FV3 dynamical core with the GFS physics at that time. And uh, uh, with, uh, we, without any tuning on the physics, that model already can show a pretty good focus Skill very comparable to the uh, GFS operational model at that time. And after the end of NGGPS, we keep working on this model's development. In 2016, we tuned the uh, uh, GFS physics to better meet our uh, FV3 dynamical core. And in 2017, we include the GFS GFDL microphysics that John just introduced and uh, the EMC SAS convection scheme. 2018, we put the GFDO microphysics scheme into the dynamical core called the inline GFDO microphysics, and also use the positive definition advection scheme in the dynamical core. And we also, uh, we also add the YSU PBL scheme and the mixed layer ocean into this model. 2019, we further update FV3, revised the GFDO microphysics, and we also use the uh, URI, the uh, the University of uh, Rhode Island uh, method to include the impact of impact of ocean waves into the model. Um, so here shows the uh, global 500 minibar ACC compared to the GFS model at a different year, and we see uh, along with the um, 
uh, the improvement of shield, the skill getting better and better for uh, the all different uh, the time, and the, uh, the rooming square error also much decrease. And also uh, show in the precipitation field, in both tropical precipitation and contrast precipitation, yearly year a year to year reduction are shown for the forecast error. Um, I we are still working on the version twenty twenty. Um, although the C seven sixty A already been online and put the put the, in the uh, operational forecast as the the, the web page I showed earlier. Um, but I would I will talk uh, more detail about this new version later. Okay, so people will ask how we further improve the forecast skill. I think we everybody knows that for especially for weather time skill, initial condition is very important. So we <clears throat> we work with ECMWF and do this very interesting study. Is we use the shear model you uh, run with both. GFS initial condition and the ECNWF IFS initial condition. Uh, we can find that use different initial condition uh, showing the, the uh, 500 minibar ACC time scale in just in a different two different group followed by its original model. And uh, we can further show that the model use the GFS initial condition and the for the Atlantic Basin tropical cyclone forecast, the track forecast error can even beat the IFS model, uh, but that's just for 2017 seasons. But is this uh, <clears throat> is still a very encouraging result? So um, we think to improve initial condition uh, is uh, is quite important, and uh, we also have an ongoing collaboration with ECMWF. And followed by our original uh, cooperation, we extended it to a diagnostic project, different models, uh, same initial condition. And so we uh, invited a lot of other global models to join, but all of them use uh, ECNW e initial condition, including the ICON model from Germany, uh, France model, uh, Met Office, uh, CMC Japan, and uh, Korea. Okay. And so since we know the importance of initial condition, we should uh, pay attention about the data assimilation since it created the initial condition. And this result is from our team member, Ming Jin Tong. She, uh, her, in, in, her, in her study, she used, the, uh, she included, she take uh, advantage from using the GFDO microphysics six category hydrometers. So in her framework, he can uh, simulate the, more uh, hydrometers. So um, for, for example, these M soon A observations, before those red dots can meet the precipitation screen criterion in deep convection, but cannot be used in the old framework. But after uh, she modified the framework, it can, it can be a useful information now, so it can improve the initial condition. Okay, and earlier I mentioned we're still working on the shield 2020 version. We try to push this flagship to a point from 13 kilometer to 8.5 kilometer, and also uh, have other major changes in both dynamical core and the microphysics. And we start to use the EMC TK EDMF PBL scheme, and also we correctly use the version 15 GFS as the initial conditions. Uh, we, we can see compared to the uh, 2019 version from this forecast validation scorecard, most uh, uh, improvement are showing in the high the wind and temperature. And uh, of, of us to the uh, uh, 500 minibar temperature and other like uh, uh, relative uh, 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 water vapor uh, scales, we're still working on to try to get a better result. Okay, so uh, in the next couple of slides, I try to show our uh, special focusing on different uh, events. First is about the hurricane forecast. Uh, the shield the C760A 13 kilometer configuration do a very good job on hurricane track forecast. But we also try to use the T-shield, the three kilometer nasty grid on, uh, to better 
better resolve the uh, stone structure and improve the intensity. And these two charts are from uh, Morris Vander is the to this year's Atlantic season track forecast error and the intensity error. And it's a very up to date until the last week. Uh, we can see the GFDO shield model does a pretty good job. And uh, the uh, GFDO T shield model do a very nice job for hurricane intensity predictions. And of course, the, uh, the T shield doesn't do that well for track forecast when we still dig on the reason. And about a severe zone forecast, we use this C shield configuration, it's a three kilometer nested cover on the corners. And we usually run five days to see the severe weather prediction. And we submit our result to the 2020 spring forecasting experiment at NOAA Hazard Weather Test Mats. And uh, from their report, they give us a highly uh, marks about our pre-stone environment and the cool pool prediction. And uh, the other, that's, that's the, the, the GFDL FV3 model. And the other FV3 best model, FV3 and SSL, predict a very nice uh, stone structure every year. And it's also related to they use different microphysics skin. And uh, the, the Thompson microphysics skin is designed for severe weather forecast. And about the Medangelian Oscillation, MJO, uh, which is a very important, especially for seamless prediction, um, because its time scale is just about as sub-seasonal to seasonal. And in GFDO, both similar type models and uh, prediction projection models can uh, uh, simulate MJO event pretty well, as long as we have a reasonable ocean as a lower boundary. So like uh, in the uh, M4 atmosphere model, it doesn't have the ocean coupling, so it can only gather the, the signal, but it cannot get the propagation uh, nicely. But after it coupled to the uh, ocean model, it shows the uh, 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 good uh, MGL propagation. And in our edge shield, uh, 25 kilometer, we use the mixed layer ocean. It can successfully get the MGO propagation. And also in the 50 kilometer sphere coupled to the Mon 6. And another way to take a look at the MGO forecast scale is the correlation coefficient along with the lead time. And for 25 kilometer as shield, we do two experiments, one using the mixed layer ocean, the other without. We can see the importance of using the mixed layer ocean can add up about eight days more uh, skillful prediction. And in the in the T shield, we also do another uh, test is to uh, better resolve the marine container area use a four kilometer nest, and we see the a nested run can. Uh, the two-way nest efficiency improve the predictability of MJO compared to the uh, unified global unified resolution runs. And uh, about the diurnal cycle, it has been a very challenging uh, thing for the CIMIN model to simulate it, correctly simulate it. But the uh, benefit from the shield model is developed based on the weather time scale. Uh, both S shield and T shield doing a very good job on dyno cycle in uh, either tropical land, tropical ocean, US continent, or even uh, North Hemisphere land. It, it'll do pretty good. And we recently start to uh, expand um, to start to use the uh, this five kilometer C shield. Uh, uh, to do S two S forecast, about, and, and it shows even until week four, we still have diurnal cycle. We still can do a diurnal cycle uh, signal very well. And the last one is I uh, want to mention about we still working on the global cloud resolving model. Uh, the X shield is globally three point two five kilometer, and uh, earlier. Uh, before SJ Ling retired, he working with C and then John and submit this configuration to the Diamond project. And as you can see this beautiful earth. 
And right now we're still working with uh, on with the uh, uh, working on it, especially we cooperate with Vulcan and the University of Washington to try to build a hybrid machine learning to emulate the X shield in a cheaper, lower resolution model to 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 use a cheaper way to achieve the global cloud resolving model. Okay, at the end, I just want to show the photo of uh, our entire AV3 team. And especially, we uh, we really honor and have a good chance to work with the uh, this genius, genius uh, DICO guide, Dr. S.J. Lim. And uh, um, our, if you want to know more detail about AV3, you can go to uh, no, the Gov AV3 to see more documentation. And earlier, I mentioned our operational uh, focus result you can find in this uh, in this website and also if you would like to use uh, uh, if you want to get the model code you can get it from the github so that's all i have thank you thank you uh Jianghui. and uh, do we have questions from audience for Jianghui and even for ling Zhong and uh, lucas Yeah, we all have a question for Jianghui. This is the way. Hi. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, yeah, I have a more like a general question. So like uh, I have for the Jianghui, from your experience in developing the uh, shield model, um, so uh, do you have any like um, uh, comments or suggestion in developing the physics part, like you think um, which aspect would be like um, important or need to be improved or which the direction should, which direction should we go? Such, yeah, a general question. Thank uh, you. You mean, you mean which part of physics we should further improve? Yeah, like based on your experience, you think, okay, for example, uh, yeah, we I, have... I take the credit of this uh, development part, <laughs> I need to, uh, mostly uh, the physics part of development is done by Lin Zhong and the dynamical core is, um, and we other good members trying to help the help the verification and try to find the problems. And maybe uh, Lin Zhong or Lucas won't enter it. Yeah, this is Lin Zhong. So, uh, can someone hear me? Yeah, yes, we can hear you. Okay, uh, um, uh, here at JFDL, we mainly uh, focus on the dynamical development and the physics development. We just focus on the microphysics and partially we focus on the um, PBL scheme. So, um, we have done a lot of developments after the earlier version of SHIELD, that is the same version of JFS version 16, uh, have using the same physics. But right now we are mostly focused on the microphysics development and we have done a lot of work to make the scheme uh, um, more, uh, more advanced and trying to push forward to use a new advantage, new feature from other microphysics scheme. So we are still working on this part. But most importantly, we think that um, Develop physics. We should know the target of why you development, why you develop the physics. So um, our target is to better have a better application, have a better uh, performance of the model. So it doesn't mean that um, when you uh, upgrade the physics or use a more advanced physics, you have a better performance. So we we need to keep in mind that uh, always always know your target and always know uh what achievement you want to make and what part of the model you want to improve and um reduce the bias that is our development ph philosophy yeah thank you so if I can... oh sorry sorry go ahead okay 
Um, so if I can expand on that, one of the things that we've really learned a lot over the years, not just in our group at GFDL, but as GFDL as a whole, is that models need to be developed as a, a holistic integrated systems. And simply just trying to focus on just improving one component won't necessarily give you a better forecast or a better climate simulation. And in particular, trying to develop like a dynamical core as a separate perfect object and then just expecting to cram it into something won't give you a better result. And also mix and matching physics parameterizations and schemes won't give you a better result either. So at all times, what really must be thought of, you have to think of a model as a holistic collection of physics, dynamics, land surface schemes, initialization, and so on. Uh, and you really need to develop as a holistic thing, keeping in, keeping in mind how things might or should interact with one another when to be able to get most out of your components. I see. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, any more questions from our audience? Okay, uh, I do have a general question. Uh, actually, uh, TFDL is very famous on the model development. Any, any plan for the Data simulation. Um, we we do have a couple of people who have hi been hired for data simulation. So GFDL has always done a very good job at ocean data simulation, and uh, we have a fantastic expert, expert uh, effort within the uh, Spear group to be able to improve the ODA. Um, so there's an excellent article that's just published uh, in James about the uh, ocean data simulation in Spear. In uh, Shield, um, yeah, it. it uh, in the atmosphere side, we haven't done as much data simulation as we did in the past. Um, at one point, GFDL is one of the world's leading centers at atmospheric data simulation. Uh, that's kind of faded over the years. Uh, we do have uh, our, our colleague Ming Jing Tong does uh, work on uh, developing uh, data simulation cycling systems for atmospheric models, though. And we're also working on land data simulation as well within the, the land modeling group. Okay, great. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, uh, last call for our audience. Uh, so, uh, Lucas and uh, Lin Jun and uh, uh, Jiang Hui, are you going to hang out for a while uh, during the practical session? Um, I need to go get my son in about 30 minutes. Um, <laughs> okay, no yeah. problem. Mm -hmm. As much as you can hang out with us, that would be great. Okay. And uh, okay. basically, yeah. <laughs> so, so for the practice section, we it will from the two thirty from uh, mountain time two thirty to uh, uh to four uh, to four uh, two two thirty to three thirty as we planned for one hour. It it, it will be a short one, and the the session is se session two. It's actually advanced topics based on the session one, the basic. Uh, Experiment. So, uh, we 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 need actually uh, turn off this Zoom meeting and uh, go through the uh, the uh, Google Meet Google Meet for the uh, practice session, uh, just like yesterday. Okay, everyone. Uh, thank you for uh, dialing, and uh, let's uh, move on to practical session. Thank you.